WFLA now will begin momentarily. WFLA now will begin momentarily. Breaking news on WFLA now. Here is J.B. Buno. More than a decade after disturbing discovery after disturbing discovery, New York authorities make an arrest in the Gilgo Beach serial murders. The suspect, a Long Island architect, has just pleaded not guilty in New York. We're live in the WFLA Now Stream Center to break this all down and most importantly, bring you a four o'clock Eastern press conference live from Riverhead, New York. Hello there to you folks. JB here with you live on WFLA Now. I'm joined also by WFLA Senior Investigator, Walt Buteau. Walt, welcome back into the Stream Center. Good to have you on. Great to be on. We're talking here about a story that is more than a decade old, and we're going to go through this. We're live a little bit early in advance of the 4 o'clock press conference uh, to kind of break this down for you. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Gilgo Beach uh, serial slayings, uh, it, it's a story that has, um, has just persisted in the minds of so many people folks on Long Island. I, I have a lot of family uh, in New York, uh, very familiar with this story. And so uh, there's just so much to break down here. And that's why we're live uh, a little bit early to discuss this. Uh, Walt, this is a story that uh, for these families uh, to get the news that an arrest has been made, the arrest, uh, the suspect's name being 59 year old Rex Hurman. Uh, he is a architect from Long Island. He was arrested uh, Thursday night around 830 uh, in Manhattan. Uh, but, of course, uh, police would show up later to his home in Massapequa on Long Island in New York. Those families, uh, this is news that they have been waiting for for a long time. Um, it's just something that uh, I can't even imagine what that's been like for the families. Uh, really, we're talking about human remains of 10 people being found over the course of the search efforts that you're looking at here in our archive video more than a decade ago. Um, so these families, uh, this is news that they are, I'm sure, still processing. You know, a lot of times with what we do, and I know you've done it, day of stories, general assignment, investigative, we talk to people, sometimes um, embarrassingly, I would say, the day of a tragedy. We try to get their side of it. We want to know how, it, how, how they are dealing with it. So we talk to them that day, maybe the next day, and the story goes on for a week, maybe two weeks and bigger stories. But what I think we lose sight of is that for them, it goes on forever, right? They don't. There's no real closure when you lose a loved one. So it's been 13 years of waiting in one case here, 15 years for another as I look at it. 22 years of waiting, or 12 years of waiting, I should say. My math's bad, but it's been it's been a decade of waiting. And to think that they somehow put it behind them, I think, is is probably short sighted. They that knock on the door or that phone call, however it happened, was something I'm sure they that brought it all back to them um, very quickly. You we're, know? we're about to play a little bit of the press conference because uh, we do have access to a feed where this 4 o'clock press conference is considered to, uh, really considered to be a major press conference at 4 o'clock where authorities are going to be speaking and taking questions from reporters. They're expected to answer a lot of those questions that people have been, of course, asking on social media in relation to this story. But the feed is, has already been active here for us in the WFLA Now Stream Center. We're about to play back uh, some of the interview. Really, no, let me say this again. The entirety of the press appearance for Michael Brown. That is going to be the attorney for 59-year-old Rex Hurman. Uh, Michael Brown saying that he, uh, as far as what he could communicate uh, to the press in relation to the suspect, the suspect saying, quote, I didn't do this. 
uh, end quote, according to his attorney, Michael Brown. Uh, he has the suspect here. I want to get this uh, right. According to multiple reports, this is uh, Gilgo Beach murder suspect Rex Heuerman. Uh, according to the New York Post, he was emotionless during his court appearance on Friday afternoon. He pleaded not guilty to three counts of first degree murder and other charges related to the deaths of three women over 10 years ago. Now, let's make this clear before we play Michael Brown here in just a second. There was a set, or excuse me, there were sets of 10 human remains that were discovered here in Gilgo Beach, that is uh, right there on Long Island, the coast of Long Island, um, uh, over the course of a search for missing woman Shannon Gilbert, who was 24 years old of Jersey City. This is going back uh, 13 years ago. As they were looking for Shannon Gilbert, this was this was a horrifying scene. Wall, imagine you're looking for one person, yeah. and they keep turning up body after body after body. I say body, but what it's human remains that were discovered here at Gilgo Beach. So this was a horrific assignment, of course, for uh, New York authorities because after they found this person and, or excuse me, these remains, that remains, thinking it was going to be Shannon. They just kept searching and finding more remains that weren't Shannon Gilbert. And, of course, this launching a, a massive investigation uh, in New York that has troubled investigators for a long time. Horrific. And then it just got worse, as you're as you're saying, that one and then two and, and then we get to 10 and the search continues, I assume, out there. Um, and uh, and you, these are the stories that sort of make you wonder. And, of course, this this individual, he's he's pleaded not guilty. And he's not guilty right now. He's just accused of only, and of, uh, I say only three, but three of the 10, right? They haven't tied him to the others. They haven't, That's they haven't accused him of the others. But still, regardless of it, whether this guy is the guy or not, it is fascinating to me that when they catch one of these individuals a decade or so, sometimes longer after these crimes, that he was out there the whole time. He was somebody's neighbor. That's right. He was somebody's friend. He was somebody's good friend, perhaps. And that they more than likely had no idea what he had actually done uh, over that time period. And it it's fascinates me because right now, there's no doubt, JB, right now, in another unsolved case, there are people out there who we have not found yet. And it's the work of these officers that, that sort of are able to piece this together over a long period of time. Very difficult. Uh, but they piece it together and... And maybe in this case have found the perpetrator. In in my understanding of this story, and I look as, as reporters, we have to catch up on a lot of what has transpired. And, and this is going back thirteen. Think about where you were, folks, thirteen years ago. It's a completely different chapter of your life. It's a long period of time that has elapsed between the search for Shannon, the discovery of these human remains, and then of course where we are today. It's an just an incredible amount of time. So here we are, thirteen years later. We've been doing some catching up in the story. To my understanding more resources have been put into this really quickly before we play the michael brown clip this is what it looked like at the home of rex Hurman, as we understand it in massapequa new york it looks like crime lab uh personnel or excuse me crime scene personnel uh who you know obviously you they know, don't want anything to get out of them off their body that could be confused with the actual evidence they're looking for. So they cover everything up. Many, And there have been cases where the, all that garb that you're watching these guys have, there have been cases where that's not worn and it, it can blow up a case. So it's, it's uh, it, just a sort of uh, eerie picture to see them out there to know what they're about to try to do in, in this uh, individual's house. Yeah, and of course, doing everything they can to make sure that you do not compromise the right, process right, because this right. is something that could play out in, in court for many, many years. It um, will. The, uh, of course, and then, uh, look, it's a long way to go. We're at the very beginning. And there was a press conference earlier. This is the police commissioner in Suffolk County, Rodney Harrison, there on your screen. There was an initial press conference this morning, and he repeatedly said, we still have a lot to get through. Obviously, the arraignment, uh, no bond has been set, as we understand it, too, by the way. But as he was going over the press conference, he kept saying, 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock p.m. Tonight, we will have an update for you. So that press conference, we're going to carry live. We're here in the Stream Center with access to multiple live camera feeds to take you to that press conference in Riverhead, New York. Uh, the feed is already set up. The New York media is already there uh, in uh, Riverhead and Michael Brown 
uh, is the attorney uh, who has been uh, who will be representing Rex Hurman, and this is what he had to say approximately 20 minutes ago. Folks, good afternoon. My name is Michael Brown. My office is at 320 Carlton Avenue, Central Islip, New York. Danielle Koish, C-O-Y-S-H, is my co-counsel in this matter. We, we just got appointed on this case. There's not much I can tell you folks at this point in time. You can't hear? Okay. There's not much we can tell you at this point, uh, seeing that we just got involved in this case. I did hear the district attorney uh, outline his case. I will say to you folks that it's extremely circumstantial in nature. Uh, in terms of speaking to my client, the only thing I can tell you that he did say uh, as he was in tears was, I didn't do this. Uh, we obviously don't have any evidence. This is the beginning of the case. Everybody is presumed innocent in our country. Uh, there's a presumption of innocence, and uh, we're looking forward to fighting this case in the court of law, not in the, in, in the court of press. Uh, tears, right? Tears. Description tears. Of someone yes. So that's all I can tell you, folks. If you have questions that I can answer, I'm happy to do that uh, on a general level. But I, again, I don't know specificity, so it would be hard for me to say that now. Was his wife in the arraignment? I, I don't know that. His sorry. exact words were, I didn't do this? Correct. In, and he was in tears. I'm sorry? Well, obviously, anybody who's arrested and charged with three murders uh, is, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but he's destroyed. Um, he's clearly destroyed about the, uh, the charges here. Um, yes. Denied it to you? Correct. What were his, his exact words? I did not do this. I did not do this. Correct. And do you believe him? My belief isn't important. Your belief isn't important. It's really about the 12 jurors that are going to be sitting in the box one day, right? You and intend to take this to trial? Absolutely. I mean, if you have an instant person, you absolutely want to take it to trial. Did you say his wife was here today? I didn't say that, sir, no. Oh, and he was right? crying while he said it? I'm okay. sorry? Where was he last night when he was arrested? I, again, I don't have these details. I believe he may have been arrested at his house, but I, again, I just stepped into this, they so I don't, I don't know the answer. Manhattan? Okay. What about all the evidence that was provided? Uh, I didn't see any evidence. Did you? But all the... Uh, You're talking about the district attorney outlining yes. everything? Yes. The district attorney uh, is a very competent prosecutor. He outlined what he thinks he can prove. Uh, it, to me, it was very circumstantial. But again, I haven't seen anything, and I haven't developed a defense, so it's, it's really hard for us to comment. Other than it's, in, it's important to know that when somebody's charged with a crime, you have to afford them the presumption of innocence. Have you been in touch with his family? I, I, just, I just got this case an hour ago, so the answer is no. What is your immediate reaction to the 200 Google searches on the Gogo case? I, I don't, I haven't seen him, I haven't looked at him, I can't tell you, I'm sorry. He was remanded right. without bail, you said you were going to do a bail application? Yeah, the judge... Yes, yeah, so the judge remanded him without bail, which is which is understandable under the circumstances. But I don't have any information in terms of risk of flight and and the strength or weaknesses of the prosecutor's case to rebut that. So at this point in time, he's remanded, and obviously we'll have the opportunity to make a bail application at a later time. One of the victim's cousins actually she spoke earlier today and was talking about the fact that you know partial justice, that she was looking for full justice, and was very emotional about it. I mean, given all that and what the DA outlined and everything. Do you believe that your client is innocent? The fact that you believe everybody that is he presumed told you that he didn't do it. Everybody is presumed. I, I don't. I don't formulate a belief in my mind as an attorney whether somebody did it or didn't do it. Number one is there's a presumption of innocence, which everybody has to afford him. And number two is whether the prosecutor, the government, can prove their case. So those are really two important things. And I'm not in a position to comment on any of that right now. All right, folks. I'll take two more, and then we got to go. I, I don't know. Uh, the judge asked us to take this case pursuant to the assigned counsel plan. I'm happy to take it, uh, and I, I don't know what his intentions are, but obviously we'll find that out at a, at a later date. Do you know how his family is doing? I, I don't. I haven't spoken to anybody. I'm sorry. All right, folks, have a great weekend. Take care. So again, that was Michael Brown, who is now the attorney for the Gilgo Beach serial murder uh, suspect, that suspect, uh, Rex Hurman, 59 years old, an architect from Long Island, uh, really an architect executive, if you will, and uh, well known uh, to folks in Massapequa. Actor Billy Baldwin uh, tweeting out, by the way, wow. that he went to school with him wow. in, in on Long Island. So uh, just uh, look, 
as somebody who grew up in New York, I can assure you that uh, everybody knows everybody in, in a sense, especially sure. within your town, the suburbs Absolutely. of Long Island. Yeah. But but really quickly here on Michael Brown, um, answering some of those questions, you were making some observations. Well, he's obviously a veteran defense attorney. They knew his name as he walked up. Oh, it's Michael Brown. It's Michael Brown. That would happen here, too. It happened in any right. television or news market out there. I thought some of the que- you know, to ask an attorney, uh, do you believe him? Do you think he did it is sort of ignoring the fact that the, the attorney's defending the guy. What's he going? How's he going to? What's, an, what's, he, what's your answer? If you, if be? you ask an attorney who is who has just been hired to, you think he did represent? It? Right. What, what is he supposed to say? Yeah, I think he did it, but I'm going to defend him anyway. No, <laughs> of course. Uh, and 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 I think it's an important point. He is, you know, when we get <clears throat> sometimes the group, especially now, we have this mob mentality of get the you know get the pitchforks and and hang them. But obviously, he is not guilty until proven otherwise. And imagine. The, the, the process of gathering enough evidence to convict someone of crimes that have been concealed for a decade. That is difficult, difficult work. Obviously, you would think there's some DNA evidence or something out there. How do you suddenly come upon this, uh, this sort of thing in a very, very cold case? And Mike Brown is pointing out he hasn't seen the evidence yet, but uh, a very... Uh, a very skilled attorney as far as dealing with the media, I could tell you that, just looking at how he handled the media. You're, you're ready for this? Yeah. New York Post, uh, New York Post doing a lot of live updates on this story. And so we attribute fully on this next nugget of information uh, to the New York Post. They are reporting um, Gilgo Beach murder suspect Rex Yorman was identified in part thanks to DNA on a tossed pizza crust wow. that linked him to one of the victims, Get according to, and they are sourcing his bail application. I don't have that paperwork uh, uh, in front of me at this moment, but according to his bail application per the New York Post, they got a DNA sample from a pizza crust that he tossed out, linking him to one of the victims. So but, so wouldn't you, would you think, let's speculate, uh, would you think you, that... You, the, the, speculate the, easy now i know no I'm, I'm just saying so not okay speculate might be the wrong word but it's not a random pizza crust he you would almost think he must have been under surveillance at that point uh, absolutely right yeah they're he, not he coming tosses across a, he so. tosses a pizza crust and an officer sees and it it's, perhaps it's yeah, absolutely wow. he's under surveillance right he's got to be because you're he's not being gonna, monitored that's right he walks out of a pizza shop and yes yeah, so, so i just said let's not speculate but we're providing context here Right. How else Bro- would you get the pizza crust? Right. That's fascinating. Yes. So, and once, look, it's law. Once you discard an item in the garbage, you're throwing it in the trash. That's right. Whether it's the trash that's taken out to your curb on the street or whether it's trash, the public trash that you have, um, you know, out on, so, so on that, Main Street. So that, if that's the evidence that sort of connects him to the crime, what was the evidence that we will find out in the coming days, weeks, that actually... Right, the other uh, end that, that actually right. sort of made them made someone look for the pizza crust. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like there had to be something else, and you wonder how long was he a suspect? And that brings us to the three or the three women, and really the the victims in this case. We're going to start here uh, by 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 <clears throat> talking about Melissa Barth- Bartholomew, uh, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. And, and I'll add Amber Costello. Uh, is uh, a former Clearwater resident. And we have that right up right now on WFLA.com from uh, our, our digital content producer, Nathaniel Rodriguez, writing this up, that um, that before Amber Costello uh, was in, um, excuse me, uh, in New York, in, in one of the Gilgo Beach victims, she had resided right here uh, in Clearwater, Florida. The Tampa Bay Times had, uh, had reported this years ago when... Um, you know, when her remains were confirmed to be found there in New York. So uh, you can click on the link in the description on this video. You might see it in the pinned comment as well. You can find it on WFLA.com, the WFLA apps. Look there. Those are the victims uh, that we're talking about. And there is Rex Shurman right there, a picture from his website. Again, this is an architect executive who works in New York City, like so many people, lives on Long Island, works in New York City makes that commute. It, back to what we said earlier, what I said earlier. It, again, the fascination for me in this, first of all, heart, you know, your heart goes out to anyone who knew these victims, obviously. Uh, but when you think of this individual who was a successful member of society, and again, only accused, if, an, if a successful member of society 
becomes a suspect in a case like this. It's just fascinating because he's not Jeffrey Dahmer, who was sort of, you know, sec secluded himself, or many of the others who, many of the others uh, serial killers who secluded himself. This suspect is someone who walked the streets and was your friend and was in the office and a successful architect, and it makes it uh, a lot more interesting and perhaps a, just a lot more disturbing that uh, that if indeed they have the right guy, that he was walking among us um, after com after allegedly or after whoever it was, if he's walking among us after committing these crimes, it just makes it frightening. Definitely frightening. If you're just joining us, folks, we're about 22 minutes away from the scheduled start time of a 4 o'clock press conference from Riverhead, New York, out in Suffolk County. That is where we are expected to learn more details on the arrest of 59-year-old Rex Hurman, the suspect in the Gilgo Beach serial murders uh, more than a decade ago. Shout out to our next star sister station, PIX11, in New York for some of the information I'm going to be throwing your way over the next uh, minute or two. Hurman, 59, lived for decades across a bay from where the remains were found. So as far as where the remains were found in Gilgo Beach, uh, Hurman did not live uh, too far away per PIX11. Um Authorities say, according to Pix 11, he is the prime suspect uh, in the killing. He was taken into custody um, in in Massapequa late Thursday. That's that's one of the things that I'm I'm curious about because I've heard the arrests occurring in Manhattan. Pix 11 saying he was taken into custody in Massapequa. That's something that we might get clarified coming up at four o'clock p.m. Um, During the news conference, somebody, the uh, Mr. Brown said he did not know. He was just learning right. the details. But somebody from the gaggle of media did yell out Manhattan. He was arrested in Manhattan. Now, right. Doesn't necessarily substanti substantiate where he was arrested. He but. might have. It, there's a chance. And he, look, I don't have information on this. But as somebody who, who knows the I, area. I know the area yeah. pretty well. Very well possibly had been taken into custody by authorities in New York and then very quickly across county lines transferred over to there Nassau County for where he was formally uh, arrested yeah, geography and charged. geography has an impact here. You're right. On, Clearly. On, right. Yeah. Because, uh, of course, New York City in, its, in and of itself is its own jurisdiction. You have then two Long Island jurisdictions, Nassau County and Suffolk County. Uh, so there's, all, there's several different law enforcement agencies at play here. In addition to the FBI has been involved in this for years so federal, state, county um, resources all being pooled together, culminating with this arrest uh, Thursday around 8.30 at night. Um, so uh, re reading here from PIX11, the news of the arrest came as a shock to some of the relatives after so many years waiting for a break in the case. In a text message, a sister of one victim telling PIX11 her family wasn't ready to speak publicly because they really hadn't had a chance to process the news today. That is a, a exact quote. Again, really haven't had a chance to process uh, the news uh, today. Hurman living in Massapequa Park, a community just north of South Oyster Bay and the Sandy Stretch that is known uh, to Long Island uh, residents as Gilgo Beach. That is where the skeletal remains were found uh, along a remote oceanfront highway in 2010-2011. Um, most of the victims in this case, also, we didn't say this earlier, most of the victims uh, had been sex workers. Um, and so, uh, of course, that is a, a component to this case. And this was, you know, Netflix really shined a light on this. How many true crime documentaries are we talking about? Oh, my God, over the years. But uh, this was one of them, uh, or I don't know if it was a documentary or a film, but 2020, uh, Netflix did the, um, the production Lost Girls. And they uh, and they put a um, uh, really a spotlight on what was what had happened in Gilgo Beach. All right, for the first time, let me hit the touch screen here and let's show you live from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. Uh, this is the Riverhead press conference that will be taking place at four o'clock. Uh, what you're seeing is everybody gets set up, including our friend over at Pix Eleven. There, you see that's our sister station. That's our uh, they're, they're very much aligned with us as far as the media goes. So uh, PIX 11's there. Uh, really, the entirety of the New York media sphere is there uh, in advance of this uh, press conference. Uh, we're expected to hear from Raymond Tierney. That is the DA there in Suffolk County, New York. We're going to be live across all platforms here on WFLA now momentarily. We'll be launching on Facebook Live. Hello to our audience on WFLA.com, the W 
FLA app, uh, as well as, uh, yeah, the WFLA uh, YouTube page. Hello, Walt says hello. I say hello. Happy Friday to wherever you are watching from. If you're uh, in New in fact, why don't we ask our commenters where exactly you're watching from? Are you watching from where we are in Florida? Are you watching from New York? Uh, let us know in the comment section, and then we'll start to take some hashtag hey JB, hashtag hey wall questions here momentarily. Some, some might wonder, and how many of these uh, these serial killings, even the smaller cases of three, four, involve um, s sex workers? And and I think people have asked, you know, why? And of course, I think part of that is you you feel as though the the killer feels as though they're they're quote unquote not going to be missed. So the so the process of somebody looking for them is going to take longer because they're not going to be missed. And I think that's a, a sad reality. It's happened more than once. Several cases involve uh, groups of, of sex workers. Well, think about it. It, it, it. This is this is a this is in relation to Craigslist and backlist, which right. I, I think Craigslist gets a, a lot of the publicity. But for a Craigslist, you know, look, a, a sex worker who is going to answering calls and going to a person's home. Is there any more vulnerable position to put yourself in to walk into a stranger's house? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about really uh, taking an enormous risk. But in generalized terms, yep. there is a there's often um, and that's not an, there's often an addiction involved, and that's not a judgment. But the point is, the mind is altered to to do that type of career. Um, I'm not saying everybody, but I think that plays a role into it. But you're right. And generally speaking, for the minds that we Quick, work from, one second, Walt, they're three, doing a mic check. Four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so my audio's coming through. I'm sorry, continue. Um, it, it's just that, you know, that that we we sort of approach it. Why would you do that? You're going to a stranger's house, but I don't think that we have the, we obviously don't have the same mindset of somebody who has chosen that way to uh, quote unquote make a living, and we don't have the same background where, you know, I think again, often that addictions are involved right so the mind is not as clear because you're right it just doesn't make a lot of sense and we have it on wfla.com amber Cost costello uh, had had struggled with drug addiction and and by and my comments by the way are, are in no means is that in any relation whatsoever to uh, associating blame as far as absolutely that not. career absolutely, absolutely not. not just making note of the fact that any career where you're showing up and walking into a stranger's home, whether it's whether you're a sex worker or otherwise, any 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 chosen line of work that 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 exists out there, if you're walking into a home that you're unfamiliar with, there's all automatically risk associated with that. If you do not know 100%. the person, especially if you're doing it late at night, especially if you're doing it in a remote area or under the cover of darkness where there's not a lot of you know witnesses or people walking by, you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position. Um, so, of course, we're here live, Walt Buteau, J.B. Buno, and we're about to launch live across all platforms in approximately 10 minutes in advance of this 4 o'clock Eastern Time press conference. Uh, the Gilgo Beach uh, serial murder suspect, uh, his name, again, Rex Shurman, uh, 59 years old. Uh, Walt, uh, I'm going to go through the timeline here uh, that we have from PIX11. Uh, are you hanging out for a bit? or, you, I, or you I've got to... like five, ten minutes, but yeah, definitely. Okay, really quick. I'm going to go through the timeline. This is going back to December of 2010. This is uh, per PIX11, our sister station. Uh, they say that a Suffolk County police canine discovered human remains in at Gilgo Beach of a different woman while they were searching for any signs of Shannon Gilbert, 24 years old, from Jersey City. That victim, uh, found on December 11, 2010, was later identified as Melissa Bartholomew. December 13th, uh, just two days later, the remains of three more bodies are found in the same location at Gilgo Beach, all within 500 feet of one another. So, can you imagine that? I mean, I mean you were talking about you're searching for one missing woman and within a 48 or so hour period you're finding the remains of four different people and now you want now you are more than likely going to stay out there and, and expand more. and expand what you're searching for keep in mind that of the four at this point Shannon Gilbert is not there so Shannon Gilbert remains missing and then four the the remains of four people are found in Gilgo Beach December 15th, 2010, the FBI offers to help in the investigation. December 16th, Suffolk County Medical Examiner's Office reports that the remains 
down are female victims, and Shannon Gilbert is not one of the four bodies discovered. You got to take the phone? Okay. That phone rang, folks, so Walt will come back in here momentarily. As we go over the timeline again, police in January, a month later, police identify a victim as Megan Waterman. January 24th, 2011. So uh, a week or so after that, police release the identity, identities of the three remaining victims, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, and Amber Lynn Costello. Suffolk County, uh, Suffolk County District Attorney Thomas Spoda uh, declares that a serial killer is responsible for these young women's deaths. So um, that was when, I mean, so... The bodies of, of four were really the remains of four women are found in Gilgo Beach. Everyone's thinking, do we have a serial killer? And that was when, in, on January 24th, they definitively told the media and told the public that a serial killer is responsible for these deaths. I mean, can think about how, how that information is received right. in a community. Or how I was thinking, I thought you were going to say, think about how you come to that conclusion. Oh, that's true, too. Um, so there's, there are similarities somehow. Um, and the similarity is this, the district attorney saying that all four victims at that stage in the investigation worked as escorts using Craigslist. I would think there has to be another connection other than that, Police, right? Yeah. Something about how they, how the remains were found M late March. So now we're fast forwarding two months. Police return to Gilgo beach to search for Shannon Gilbert. Again, they discover another set of human remains. It's about a mile east from the original location where the others were found, and police find a skull, forearm, and hands. Police declare that the fifth set of remains are not those of Shannon Gilbert. So keep in mind, they have not found, found Shannon Gilbert up until this point, and five female bodies, uh, or the remains from five female bodies, are discovered uh, near, in the Gilgo Beach area. April 4th to 5th, 2011, so fast forwarding about a week, police discover three additional sets of human remains, bringing the total body count to eight. Shannon Gilbert, again, not among the bodies discovered. So Shannon Gilbert missing eight bodies now. April 11th, police discover two more sets of remains in separate locations along Ocean Parkway, bringing the total number of bodies in the Gilgo Beach serial killings to 10. December 13th, fast forward six months, Shannon Gilbert's body is discovered in an Oak Beach marsh about a mile away from her belongings. So my goodness, a, a double digit body count in the search for Shannon Gilbert, and it becomes clearly evident to, to uh, uh, officials, to, to investigators, that they have a serial killer right. on their hands. But obviously at this point, there are charges involving only three of the victims. So... You have to, so I, the assumption is going to be, oh, he, all 10 are involved, but they're not. Um, now, logic would tell you 10 bodies found in the general area, same general area. Yeah. You know, yeah. But Ocean Parkway, all, all, yeah, but again, all, all you, Ocean you wonder, Parkway. I've driven Ocean Park. I know I'm familiar with Ocean Parkway. But you, so you, so you, you, you wonder, you know, one question for that, for the uh, news conference is, um, you know, how, what's the difference in connecting the three and not connecting the other seven. Right. What, what do you have? Something, something dif differentiated. You have a the little three. bit more. That's right. On those three, somehow, maybe it's the DNA. If the pizza crust story is correct, maybe it's the DNA. Real quick, folks, I want to show you this live feed here again. I'm not satisfied with the quality of this feed, and I'm sure our audience also looking at this and being like, "My goodness!" So I'm going to talk to our team here in the stream center. We're going to mute mute microphones here for just a minute. Stand by for 30 seconds as we talk to our team to, to kind of get a better version of this signal. Stand by.
All right, we're back. As this is a result of an enormous contingency of media being crammed in one room. It reduces the strength That's somehow because right. they're Cause all using all being the same fed band. Out. Everything's coming out over the internet. And so when you try to cram 50 toothpicks in one straw, this is what you get as a result. That's my We need very 6G. Do we have 5G uh, yet? Uh, what do man, we have? I'm, How I'm, many Gs I'm, we got now? I think we're up to 5G. We need a 6 or 7G. Yeah. We need we need more we G. We need more G, man. Got to have more G. We've got right here. But it's not like it, the media ain't shrinking uh, yeah. as far as as far as the 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 uh, this the, like the internet part of it. There may there maybe maybe uh newspapers are shrinking and some TV stations, but there's going to be plenty. We need more bandwidth. We need more bandwidth here. And um and, and so it's, but look, it looks our, like it got a little better. Yeah, doesn't they're, they're working it? I can on read it. They're the uh, I can read the um advertisement in the back hello to our audience on youtube live we're going to reset here just a moment and welcome in our facebook live audience momentarily if you're joining us on wfla.com the wfla app wherever you're watching from anywhere in the world happy friday to you from walt and and myself uh walt are, are you uh i know you, i got your, a couple, your more, phone's couple more minutes any other observations that you want to make as we, we we talk about this story because you're right. You're a very astute observation. Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello are the three uh, female victims that are associated with the respective charges that have been filed against Rex Hurman. Uh, but there's other victims here that deserve justice. And so uh, there have been um, attorneys for the victims issuing statements to the media and we've had difficulty keeping up because there's so many victims yeah. in this case right and they're all speaking to different media outlets it's kind of been a frenzy of activity on, on social media with with uh with this story today but there has been a lot i think multiple attorneys have been speaking out multiple family representatives have been speaking out saying we don't believe that all of the 10 remains that were found are are fall under one victim's response, or excuse me, one suspect's responsibility. They believe that there is more than one person responsible for this so that uh, they don't believe that Rex Hurman is the only suspect that's in these killings. That's interesting. Let me also point out, too, that... Um, but it's also extremely coincidental, beyond belief to some degree, that you'd find 10 bodies in generally the same area do you know the area i mean is it, 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 it well, what, what's well, look, the farthest well, hold on, hold part on. that let me let me explain I, I do know the area but gilgo beach is not the beach you go to on saturday with your friends and and, and are drinking like mark it, it, it's it's this area is very marshy okay and it's very um more of a beach walk sort of setting and that might even be a, that's that's a stretch right? clamming it, I, clamming look, it's it's just not it's I, not i get i get it it's a it's sort of uh i've dri i've been on ocean parkway in the past but i've it. never I've really seen, been to gilgo yes. beach i've never been there right it's Even not pismo no it's not clearwater beach it's not clearwater beach no, it's right. a it's a beach but it's more of a like you said marshy so it's secluded yes it is secluded but do we know the do we know how close the bodies the proximity of the bodies we do and it, well at least the first eight were i believe hold on excuse me the first four were all found within 500 feet of each other okay and that's close but to think there's six others even if it's and they're all in G the gilgo beach area that just makes you wonder is that the place for some reason where bodies get dumped i mean there you know there's are you know off-color jokes about you know bodies in the in the hudson river and all that stuff and i think every region has one of those places where things are left. But is that, if these attorneys are saying that that they think there are other killers, is it just somehow common knowledge that that's a good place to dump a body? That's frightening, actually. Well, if it, that's the case. It's it, certainly it, it, an it makes area. It's more frightening if it's one. It's more frightening if it's more than one than it's if it's just one. It's, I mean, we're, talking about, we're talking about 10 10 sets of human remains that were found in the search for Shannon Gilbert 13 years ago. 10 families that lost lost someone. Utterly insane. Yeah. I mean, uh, just and um, my goodness, you think about the uh, you think about the, the victims' families and, and you just can't even imagine what they have been through and, and not having answers all these many years later. And now it gets opened up again and um, and it, they and the answers will come somewhat slowly. 
you know, we'll have this news conference, but of course they're going to, I'm sure, uh, keep it close to themselves, a lot of the details, and, and we won't find out a lot right away, and then it'll trickle out. As paperwork is filed, as evidence is uncovered, as search warrants are issued for perhaps other scenes or sites uh, that are tied to the defendant, you'll find out more information in those affidavits. All right, let's see here who is walking up. And uh, now that we have our, our feed situation uh, fixed, we're going to launch live across all platforms. Stand by. WFLA now will begin momentarily. WFLA now will begin momentarily. Breaking news on WFLA now. Here is J.B. Buno. New York authorities have made an arrest in the Gilgo Beach serial murders from more than 13 years ago. The suspect, a Long Island architect, has pleaded not guilty this afternoon and we're moments away from a press conference where we're expected to learn more information about an arrest more than a decade in the making. Hello there to you folks. JB here with you live now officially across all platforms on W. FLA now. We were just live with Walt Buteau, our senior investigator. He had to step away for other stories that are unfolding today uh, in the state of Florida. This was the scene uh, earlier on today uh, in Massapequa on Long Island in New York, the home of 59 year old Rex Hureman. And I'm going to show you the home here. Um, excuse me, show you Rex Hureman here from his website, Rex Hureman Consultants and Associates. He is the suspect that has been arrested and now pleaded not guilty uh, in the uh, in relation to the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Amber Costello, uh, who used to live in right here in the Tampa Bay area in Clearwater, uh, Florida. Uh, there has been a lot of difficulty with many media organizations descending on Riverhead, New York. Uh, the signal out of this room is just horrendous. Uh, and this is a scenario that is unfolding for a lot of different media organizations that are having difficulty calibrating any kind of a meaningful signal because this is the most highly anticipated press conference of the day without a, without a doubt. Uh, social media, of course, um, talking about this story quite a bit as far as uh, going back to 13 years ago when body after body remains after remains, they just continuously get, kept get, getting found uh, in Gilgo Beach, uh, New York, uh, as they were searching for, authorities were searching for at the time, missing 24-year-old woman Shannon Gilbert of Jersey City. But as those searches uh, for Shannon, I'll show you some of the video that we have here as well as those search efforts for shannon would play out over uh those weeks those exhausting days and weeks uh, they would just continuously find more human remains and every time they sent off the human remains to determine who that person was it was another female and it was not shannon gilbert they kept finding all of these remains until the body count reached double digits and uh, of course these victims um uh, their families have been uh, been just uh, praying for justice for more than a decade now. And an arrest has been made in the form of 59-year-old Rex Hureman, who told his attorney, Michael Brown, I didn't do this. Uh, Rex Hureman uh, pleading not guilty on uh, in a Long Island arraignment uh, just this afternoon. So we're trying to get a, an improved signal here for you folks. Uh, but as of right now, uh, the signal... Uh, continuously is breaking up due to the high volume of media presence uh, at the location of the District Attorney's Office of Suffolk County. This is Riverhead, New York, and we're trying to recalibrate this signal to get 
uh, the press conference um, back here for you. We'll do our very best uh, to bring it here to you live. One of the reasons why there's a lot of people work moving around right now is because they're trying to improve the signal quality. But as I explained earlier, as far as the, uh, the analogy that I can use to describe what it's like when you have an inside press conference at a, you know, at a, an official government building like this, everyone's trying to get on the same internet and it's like cramming 50 toothpicks into a straw. Everyone's just fighting and competing for their bandwidth real estate. And, um, and certain signals are gonna, as this signal improves, the signals for other media organizations, theirs are gonna deteriorate. So it's gonna be a tug of war for bandwidth uh, as they try to get a feed out from the district attorney's office uh, in, in Suffolk County. But we wanted to get live with you here, folks, across all platforms to give everybody a chance to reacclimate, re-understand uh, this story, or for those of you who have never heard of the Gilgo Beach uh, serial murders, um, find out about it for the first time. Uh, this is uh, news that has haunted this community uh, in Long Island uh, for a long time, and now it has really taken a turn for those in Massapequa uh, because they have been, uh, if New York officials are correct, if investigators have their man and they are indeed right, uh, if, if this person, Rex Hjorman, 59 years old, is the suspect responsible for at least these three murders, uh, then they have, this has been a, a frightening reality because they have been living uh, maybe on the same street or going to, to work or taking the Long Island Railroad all with this person for a period of more uh, than a decade. Uh, I'm gonna step away for a moment to try to recalibrate this signal, but the press conference hasn't started just yet. We expect it to begin uh, sometime in the next few minutes. Again, they called it for 4 o'clock Eastern time. The time now, 4.04 Eastern time. Stand by. All right, good news here for you folks. A Another feed is uh, starting to materialize here. Uh, as soon as we have this feed, uh, we will uh, go to this one here as well. Uh, and actually, no, this feed is now live. So you see what I'm talking about with the competing signals coming out of the district attorney's office of Suffolk County. That's what one feed looks like. And this is what the other feed looks like. Uh, this press conference expected to begin momentarily. If you've just found this live stream and are looking for information, don't go anywhere. And just like we were talking about the tug of war, right? The other feed looks awful. This one has now uh, reached HD quality. So we'll stay here with you live on this feed as we're about to get the press conference starting here any moment. folks i just communicated with our team we now have three feeds up coming into the stream center uh and being able to of course bring you this coverage here from the stream center we're able to get a lot of different feeds loaded up here but by far the the toothpick that is winning so to speak as far as uh, the analogy i was making earlier this is the best feed and we'll stay with this feed again the press conference is expected to begin momentarily again uh, the highly anticipated information and actually now I think we have, oh no, I thought that that was officials walking in. Or no, this is actually the press conference. I believe this is beginning now. After the press conference is over, what we are gonna do is we are gonna take your comments and questions live. So after the press conference, we'll break down what we have learned and what we are still to learn here from New York.
Again, this is live on all platforms on WFLA Now, live from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. Um, you know, I'm standing here with uh, my law enforcement partners in the Gilgo Task Force uh, to announce uh, the indictment of Defendant Rex Andrew Heerman, 59 years of age. Uh, he's been arrested by the Suffolk County uh, Police Department's homicide detectives, and he's been indicted uh, in a grand jury present, uh, presentation by the, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office uh, for the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Uh, the, the investigation of Maureen Brandon Barnes is ongoing. Uh, these young women went missing between July of 2007 and September of 2010. They were found in De uh, December of 2010 by the Suffolk County Police Department, and then there was nothing, absolutely nothing. For, their, for the next 13 years, their cases went unsolved, until today. Uh, when I took office in January 2022, I made uh, Gilgo a priority. I made Gilgo a priority before I took office. I met uh, with the victims' families, uh, some of whom I'm proud to have standing with us today, and I told them that we were gonna handle this case differently. We were gonna do it differently. And that when I showed up, you weren't going to see me calling the media and being on Gilgo Beach with a giant uh, uh, magnifying lens looking for clues 12 years after the case. What I was going to do was I was going to work with my task force. We were going to form, a task force. form this task force and we were going to work together and we were going to, we were going to use the grand jury, the power of the grand jury to, cut, to, to reach a determination in this case. Because the grand jury has two things. It has power, it has reach. You could obtain documents, you could interview witnesses. But the other thing that the grand jury has, the grand jury has secrecy. No one knows what you do when you operate a grand jury proceeding. And we knew that when we were investigating this case and it, when we dealt with the media or whatever it was we were doing, um, we, were, we were playing uh, before a party of one, because we knew uh, the person responsible for these murders would be looking at us. So we were very careful uh, how we, we, we handled the investigation. We maintained the integrity of the investigation. Uh, most, important, uh, most importantly of all, we maintained the secrecy uh, of that investigation. And I think that's, uh, that's paid dividends uh, as we've seen today. Now, um, I, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, when we had the, uh, the task force, uh, the first thing we did, got together with uh, um, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison. Uh, we formed the task force. Our first meeting uh, was February, February 1st of 2022. Uh, and what we did, what well, all of the agencies here, we made the commitment. We were going to take our talented, our most talented investigators. So in the district attorney's office, we took uh, uh, ADAs, myself included. We took analysts. We took detective investigators. And they worked on a daily basis with other talented investigators from all of the agencies here. Um, and uh, we started that in February 1st, in 2022. Six weeks later, on March 14th, 2022, the name Rex Heurman was first mentioned as a suspect uh, in the Gilgo case. A New York State uh, investigator was able to, uh, to um, identify him in a database, uh, and from that point on, we used the power of the grand jury, over 300 subpoenas and search warrants, uh, looking into this, this individual's background, to bring us to this day. So I'm, I am, uh, I'm proud, I, I know that this case is over, but I'm proud of what we've accomplished up to this point. I know we have more to accomplish, but I'm also uh, thankful, thankful for the partnership uh, of, of the task force, because certainly 
without the participation of the task force, we wouldn't be standing here. Um, you know, before I, I, you know, I thank some, some folks and, and turn it over to, uh, to uh, our, our partners, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the evidence in the case. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people know about the case. As I indicated, uh, the, uh, the victims went missing between July of 2010 and September, uh, I'm sorry, July of 2007 and uh, September of 2010. Uh, and uh, in December of 2010, they were, uh, the, their, their bodies were recovered. Uh, they were buried in a similar fashion, in a similar location, um, uh, in, a, in a similar way. Uh, all the women were petite. Uh, they were, um, they, they all did the same thing for a living. Uh, they all advertised the same way. Uh, and there were, uh, immediately, there were similarities with regard uh, to the to the uh, the crime scenes, uh, all the women's all the women were bound at the head, uh, at the midsection, uh, uh, or at the chest, and later at the legs. Um, the other thing I think that that um, uh, was was uh, that's been talked about in the uh, in the media was they were bound by um, burlap. Uh, media, uh, that has taken a life of its own in the media, and the burlap has has been described or thought to be. Uh, the burlap that's used at a nursery for uh, it, that's not the burlap that was used in this case. The burlap is it was camouflage burlap uh, used for duck blinds of hunting. Um, uh, so uh, I, obviously it, it, it was used to hide, uh, purposely hide the bodies. Um, one thing that became immediately apparent uh, th was at the time of the uh, each of the murders, uh, the murderer, the the defendant, Herman. Uh, he got a, a uh, he got a, a cell phone uh, and a burner phone, which uh, which is prepaid and anonymous. And for each of the murders, he got an individual burner phone, and he used that to communicate with the victims. Uh, then, shortly after uh, the death of the victims, uh, he then would uh, would get rid of the burner phone. Uh, and uh, right away in December of 2012. Uh, FBI uh, cast analysts, uh, special agents with the cast unit of the FBI, they immediately began looking at that cell site uh, uh, data. They compared the victims' phones with, uh, with the burner phones, and they immediately uh, honed in on some, some sim similarities, specifically uh, in the Massapequa Park area. And they looked at the, an area of a confluence of four cell towers uh, and they realized that this was had uh, significance because uh, the the uh, perp perpetrator of these crimes was probably located within this area uh, during at or around the times of the murderer, uh, and that was mapped out. That was called the box, and it was an area uh, in Massapequa Park. Uh, the FBI also managed to do that for an area in mid Midtown Manhattan. Um, and so that was that was an investigative lead. The other uh, investigative lead at the time was even though there, there was a significant amount of time that elapsed with regard to uh, before the the uh, the victims were recovered, there was some uh, some significant evidence recovered. Uh, specifically, there was a uh, um, hair recovered from Maureen uh, Brainerd Barnes from a belt buckle that was around her legs. Uh, there, uh, with regard to Megan Waterman, uh, there were three hairs recovered um, uh, from, from her, uh, one uh, from around her head area, one from around her, her, her leg area in the burlap, and then there was one caught in between the tape. Uh, and uh, that was recovered. Uh, Amber Costello also had a hair, a significant hair that was recovered uh, during the time, uh, during the, the time of the recovery. But uh, again, uh, the crime scene, because it w was out there for so long and because uh, it was exposed to the elements, uh, those hairs were degraded, so you couldn't use traditional DNA um, analysis on it. You would, uh, you would have to wait uh, and use mitochondrial DNA. And back in uh, 2010, the technology wasn't there for mitochondrial DNA. So the investigation proceeded, but also technology proceeded as well. Uh, and then in January and February of 2022, we, we formed the task force. We began working uh, collectively. Uh, and then a mere six weeks later, on March 14th, 2022, Rex Heurman was identified for the first time 
Uh, and the manner in which that was done was uh, the New York State investigator looked at a database. Uh, Amber Costello, the day before her uh, disappearance on September 1st, uh, 2010, uh, she, uh, uh, con uh, she um, met with an, an individual for the purposes of, of having him pay her money uh, for, for her services. Um, but she, uh, she would involve, she involved herself in a ruse where once the, the individual gave her, uh, gave her money, and, uh, uh, other individuals came into the, the house, pretended to be a significant others, confronted the individual uh, with the purpose of, of making that individual uncomfortable, having him leave without retrieving his money. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so uh, that individual was identified as, as a person who was between 6'4 and 6'6, uh, a, a large man, thickly built, not necessarily overly muscular, but just a naturally a uh, big person with glasses, white, uh, and, and dark hair. Uh, also of significance was um, that the fact that he was driving a dark colored or black uh, av uh, uh, first, uh, first generation uh, Chevrolet Avalanche with a, a, a very uh, unique feature that was between the, the, it's a pickup truck, so it was between the cab and the bed. Uh, and that was identified. Again, that was back uh, in uh, 2010. Uh, but it, w it wasn't until uh, March of, of, of 2022 uh, that that database uh, was, by, was, was, dis was searched uh, by the, the task force, uh, and this individual uh, uh, was, was identified. Uh, that, uh, that individual was uh, Rex Heurman, the defendant. Uh, and right away, there were some con commonalities that came right to the fore. Rex Yerman, 6'4", largely uh, a large person, not necessarily uh, muscular, but a, a very uh, physically large person. Uh, he has glasses. Uh, he, has, he has that the dark hair. And also, a particular note, he owned, at the time, that first generation Chevy Avalanche. Uh, but there was more. Uh, he lived at 105 First Avenue, which was located within that box area that the FBI first uh, discovered in, in 2012. Uh, but there was more. Uh, also, he worked at the time at an architect, as an, uh, he owned his own architectural firm uh, at an address at 19 West 36th Street in Mid Midtown Manhattan. And that was also the area of interest that was identified by the FBI in 2012. Uh, again, that was March 14th, uh, 2022. Uh, and from that point on, our, our partners and uh, my office, we used the grand jury to continue to investigate. And we executed over 300 subpoenas, search warrants pertaining to this individual to find out more information. Uh, one of the things that we did is we followed him because we wanted to get an abandonment sample of his DNA, uh, which we were able to do. Uh, we also got uh, DNA samples, abandonment samples from his family. And then we went back and we got mitochondrial DNA testing. And with regard to, um, you know, and, you know, uh, there's, an, itch, there's a, uh, an aspect of New York State law that doesn't allow me to talk about uh, DNA testing, uh, specifically at press conferences. It's, um, so I can't do that. However, at the... Um, at the uh, uh, arraignment, uh, and also when we filed our bail letter, we talked about the significance of that uh, evidence. So, if anyone needs to see that, but but uh, suffice to say, uh, that evidence was, was significant, uh, especially with regard to uh, the other evidence that we had developed. But it was uh, there was uh, another interesting aspect. We looked at the Yerman family uh, travel records, and we learned that during the murders of uh, the last three women, um, Bartholome, Waterman, and Costello, that during the commission of those murders, the, the, uh, the defendant's wife and children were, at, were out of New York State, and he was alone in the tri-state area. Uh, we also went back and looked at his cell site records, and we, were, we, we compared his personal cell site records with that of the four target phones, and we saw that there was areas of commonality. In other words, 
that whenever the, the target phones would, uh, would, would bounce off a cell tower, if, if the uh, Yerman uh, personal phone uh, bounced off a, a, a tower, it was always consistent and in close proximity uh, with the target phones. And at no time was there ever an instant where those target phones were, for instance, in New Jersey while uh, the defendant was, was on Long Island. Uh, so that was completely um, uh, consistent. The other thing that we looked at was uh, we looked at his use of burner phones, uh, and we, we followed, using the grand jury, using the great investigative help from our partners, we followed his use of burner phones. We were able to uh, identify seven separate burner phones that he used. We were able to use fictitious uh, or fraudulent email addresses and get Google warrants, and from there, we got his searches. Uh, and we learned uh, what, we, what, uh, the individ what the defendant was searching. Uh, in a 14-month period, he had over 200 searches pertaining to uh, the Gilgo investigation. Uh, not only were those, uh, was he looking at uh, in investigative insight, uh, he was looking, trying to figure out how is the task force using cell phones to try to figure out what's happening. What are the developments with regard to the task force? And this, uh, this really um, um, supported our decision to keep our investigative um, focus secret because we knew that this one person would be watching and we didn't want to give him uh, any insight into what we were doing. And we also didn't want him to know just how close we were getting. Uh, so we maintain the, the, the grand jury secrecy, and we maintain the integrity of our investigation. Uh, in addition to those, those uh, um, uh, Gilgo searches, he was searching, compulsively searching, pictures of the victims, but not only pictures of the victims, pictures of their, uh, their uh, relatives, their, their, their sisters, uh, their children, uh, and he was trying to locate those individuals. Uh, in addition to that, there was a lot of uh, torture, uh, porn, and, and uh, um, what you would consider, uh, you know, uh, um, depictions of women uh, being abused, uh, being raped, and being killed. Um, in addition to all of that, uh, we continued to look uh, and uh, we uh, were able to uh, determine uh, that that Chevy Avalanche that was used during the commission of the Amber Costello crime, uh, that Chevy Avalanche was in South Carolina. And again, with the help of our uh, partners, uh, we were able to capture, uh, we were able to seize that uh, uh, Chevy Avalanche pursuant to a search warrant, and we're certainly going to analyze that. In addition to that, uh, pursuant to the arrest of the defendant last night by the Suffolk County uh, Police Department, we, we obtained one of his burner phones, his last burner phones. Uh, the investigate, as I said, the, this case is not over. It's only beginning. We're continuing to execute search warrants, and we anticipate getting more evidence. Uh, before I, I turn it over to my partners, I, I, I want to I wanna thank a lot of people in the room. First and foremost, I want to thank the victims in this case. You know, it's always inspiring as a prosecutor when you get to meet uh, the victims. Uh, and while sometimes our defendants could embody the very worst of humanity, it seems that invariably our victims embody the very best of what it means uh, to be human. And uh, in this case, it was no, no different. Uh, I've gotten to know the families, and I'm inspired by them, and I'm impressed by their patience uh, and by their, their dogged, uh, persistence in not only supporting uh, their their lost uh, sisters or or or, or mother uh, or or daughter, uh, but also really uh, you know really standing for victims everywhere. So I want to I want to I want to thank them all uh, so much, uh, and I want to let them know that we're going to continue to work this case. Um, the next thing I want to do, I just want to thank I th want to thank our, our partners. I want to thank. Uh, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison. Um, you know, we said it was a change. And when we talked about, you know, not going before the media, if you see, um, you know, me, Rodney did go before the media. Uh, but it was always in a very controlled manner. 
and it was always with a controlled purpose. Again, we did that because we knew we were playing before a, an audience of one person. Uh, and so I want to thank Rodney for his partnership. Uh, most importantly, I want to thank Rodney for his integrity. I think in the past, what the reason why uh, uh, these uh, various investigations fell short was because there was a lot of outside influence, a lot of people who had nothing to do with the investigation, nothing to do with the, um, uh, the, the uh, investigation or any of the agencies that were actually handling the investigation. They still asserted pressure on those investigations. That did not happen with our task force. Our task force were, was run by our members, uh, and we did uh, what we thought was in the best uh, the best investigative steps and what was in the best interest of the of the investigation. So I want to thank Rodney for that uh, and, and his whole team. I, I know that we have Suffolk County homicide here, Kevin Beyer. Uh, we, we, we've got uh, Inspector Rowan. Uh, and I know that they've been around and I know that they're here and I know that they stand in the shoes of their past investigators. And I want to congratulate them and I want to thank them for their partnership. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Sheriff Errol Toulon, everything I said about uh, Rodney, I could say about Errol. Uh, Errol uh, is an unbelievable partner. Uh, he was an unbelievable partner in this case. Uh, during the, the pendency of this case, and one of the reasons why we, we had to take this case down was we learned that the defendant was using these alternate uh, um, identities and these alternate instruments to continue to patronize sex workers. Uh, which, of course, made us very nervous. Uh, but with, with the help of, of um, the sheriff and his database and his uh, analysts, we were able to continually uh, stay uh, one, uh, one step ahead of the defendant. So, so thank you, uh, Sheriff Toulon. I want to thank um, the FBI. I know um, Assistant Director in Charge Michael Brodak is here. I want to thank his entire team. You know, when you have the FBI uh, not only do you have tremendous resources uh, and insight, uh, whether it's the Behavioral uh, Sciences Unit, whether it's CAST, uh, whether it's CART, which is their computer unit, but you also have the ability to seize a car in uh, South Carolina. I can't seize a car in South Carolina without uh, the FBI. So, so thank you for that, uh, and thank you for your partnership, and thank you for, for, for your willingness uh, to work with us. I want to... I wanna, um, Thank the New York State Troopers. Uh, I know Major Udis is here and his team. Uh, you know, uh, this case is, is emblematic of, of great cooperation, but we always get that same level of cooperation from the state police, uh, no matter what uh, case we're working. So I want to thank them. Their investigators did a great, uh, um, uh, did great work on this job and uh, in this case, and we couldn't have done it without them. Um, lastly, I want to thank uh, Nassau County Police Commissioner Pat Ryder, I don't know if he's here. Did he make it? <laughs> um, you know, this this case, as I said, spans you know 13, 13 years, and during that time, um, you know, Pat Ryder has been our neighbor to the west. When it started, I think he was a sergeant, uh, detective sergeant, maybe uh, uniform sergeant, but whatever. Whenever we needed something to be done, or whenever the task force needed uh, something to be done, uh, Pat Ryder would do it, and he would do it quietly without much fanfare, and we know he would keep the confidentiality of our grand jury and our investigation. So I want to thank him for that. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to uh, Commissioner Rodney Harrison. Good afternoon. Today is a good day. And before I acknowledge the individuals that had a role in getting to this place, I would first and foremost like to offer my deepest condolences to the family members. To the family members of Amber Costello, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman. I can only imagine what you had to adore 
over the last decade regarding knowing that your killer was still loose. God bless you. So I've had, I've had the privilege of being the police commissioner nearly about two years now, and uh, I have had that investigative experience in the NYPD uh, as a detective, as the chief of detectives. And when I was going through the process of being the police commissioner, my engagement with the county executive was I was very familiar with this unfortunate homicide, homicides. And I wanted to let it be known that this was going to be our number one priority. But I also want to make this very clear, that this arrest was made by the investigators assigned to the task force. I announced during a press conference 18 months ago about a new team effort that was going to investigate the homicide, and that was going to consist of people from Ray Tierney's office, from Mike Brodack, FBI. Mike, thank you so much. State Police, Steve, appreciate your support. Dr. Earl Talon, Jr., thank you, sir. As well as the investigators from the homicide detectives in Suffolk County. Gentlemen, thank you for all you've done working together with us making sure we are here today. I also want to thank my partner, Pat Ryder. Pat, good seeing you, man. And uh, former NYPD Police Commissioner, Keyshawn Sewell, for providing resources to assist in the investigation that brought us here today. So one of my first acts was to survey the scene. When I first got assigned as a police commissioner, me and Kevin Breyer went over to Gilgo Beach. I want to uh, thank Kevin. You know, when I first met Kevin, he broke the whole case down and where we stood. He knew the case like the back of his hand. He worked tirelessly in this case. Uh, Kev was in charge of overseeing the task force since its creation, and you did a phenomenal job, Kev. Thank you. So there's something that I learned from a former NYPD Police Commissioner, James O'Neill, which is in order to fight crime or to solve investigations, you have to make sure you're working with your law enforcement partners. The blueprint in making this arrest was a whole team effort. Everybody left their eagles at the door and made sure that they brought the knowledge and the resources to this investigation. Fresh eyes on this case and the resiliency of our investigators allowed us to identify Rex Hureman. Ladies and gentlemen, Rex Hureman is a demon that walks among us, a predator that ruined families. And if not for the members of this task force, he would still be on the streets today. However, even with this arrest, we're not done. There's more work to do in this investigation regarding the other victims of the Gilgo Beach bodies that were discovered. I'm going to encourage anybody that still has information, call our Crime Stoppers hotline, 1-800-220-TIPS. I want to recognize and thank my chief of detectives, John. Thank you for your great work. Deputy Police Commissioner Anthony Carter, both of you who provided update information regarding the case and let it be known if there was any resources that they needed that you brought it to my attention. Since the discovery of the first victim, there's been a lot of scrutiny and criticism regarding how this investigation was handled. I will tell you this, the investigators 
were never discouraged. They continued and, and uncovered evidence and followed the leads. They never stopped working and will continue to work tirelessly until we bring justice to all the families involved. Last but not least, I want to thank my predecessors uh, that came before me, the work that they did. I want to thank them for really uh, laying the foundation that helped us get to here today. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Brodak. I'm the FBI Special Agent in Charge of the New York Office's Criminal Division. The FBI expanded its full set of resources in support of our local and state partners to advance this investigation. The charges show that we can overcome the most difficult challenges when federal, state, and local law enforcement work together under one task force. While nothing can fill the void caused by the loss of a loved one, through today's announcement, we are hopeful that the families of the victims begin to experience a sense of peace, closure, and justice, and that the general public feels safer knowing that an alleged killer is no longer roaming free. The actions taken today should serve as a reminder that the FBI, along with our law enforcement partners, will continue to be resolute in our determination to bring all offenders to justice, no matter how many years has passed. I would like to thank Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney and his prosecution team, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison and the Suffolk County Police Department, the New York State Police, and the investigators and staff of the FBI New York Field Office, including the Long Island Violent Crime Task Force. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Errol D. Toulon, Jr., and I'm the sheriff of Suffolk County. I would profoundly like to thank the district attorney and the police commissioner uh, for including me not only here today, but for including the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office and recognizing the importance of jail intelligence. It is extremely important when you realize that we created our human trafficking unit in 2018, that there are victims in our community and that intelligence is being shared by many of the men and women who are incarcerated today. And we have seen many disjointed investigations occur and leading up to the leadership of these two men have really brought everything together. I am proud that today we stand here a little bit closer to bringing closure to the families and extend my deepest condolences to all of you. Because of the nature of this case and recognizing that human trafficking and corrections intelligence is so important, we realize that there are many other cases that are going on that will, we will help to solve going forward. So I thank my intelligence staff and team that are here today for their diligence and their work. While we did our part in this investigation, we continue because we have to house this individual. We have already designated uh, or talked about certain locations where we will house him and in addition, the security measures we will implement in our facility uh, to make sure that this individual is brought to justice the way he should be. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Colonel Richard Allen, uh, the field commander with the state police. And I want to start by expressing my, my sincere condolences to the family members that are here today. Although losing a loved one, you can never completely get rid of that pain, but hopefully these steps that are taken here today are a step in the right direction for you to start in the healing process or work through the healing process. I want to thank the members of the task force, all the agencies you see behind me. When we were approached in 2022 to be part of this task force, we were fully engaged. Um, glad to be part of this. Uh, we, we assigned investigators on a full-time basis. You know, what, what you see um, being done here today is the end game of agencies working together, as was said before, with no egos, all egos put aside, with the sole mission to find justice for these victims. You know, um, here in, in Troop L, 
Major Steven Yudis oversees the operations down here. He has been intricately involved in this task force since we became partners with it. And I'm going to ask him to come up and, and say a few words or expand upon this a uh, little bit of our role in the, in the task force. <clears throat> Thank you, Colonel. Good afternoon. I'm Major Steve Utis, New York State Police Troop L, Long Island Troop Commander. I'd like to take this opportunity to start off by acknowledging the DA, Ray Tierney, and Commissioner Rodney Harrison for having the vision to see that forming a task force might breed new light into this investigation. The state police were asked in early 2022 to join this task force, and once requested, we were more than willing to do so. We were also very pleased that we were able to make some very meaningful contributions in this case to help propel it forward. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the task force members from the different agencies and congratulate them on a job well done. I think this case represents an example of what we as law enforcement can do when we pool our resources together and we work together. I would also like to mention the state police member assigned to this task force. You were provided with a mission, and that mission was to participate in this task force, put everything else that you were doing aside, assume, place 100% of your attention on this case, and help push this case forward. You more than accomplished that mission. I congratulate you on a job well done, and I commend you for your outstanding work. To the families, I'd like to say that on behalf of myself and the New York State Police, we offer you our deepest condolences. We recognize that these crimes may have happened years ago, but that pain continues. Our hope is that this development today provides you with some relief and some comfort knowing that the person responsible for, the, for your loved one's death is now being held accountable, and he's no longer a threat to anyone else in society. I want you to know, additionally, that the state police is not done here. We are remaining committed and will continue to support the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, the Suffolk County Police Department, and this task force as we move into the next phase of this process. That's the prosecution. I would also like to say something to everyone watching this with us today. There's been a lot of discussion here today about charges, about the suspect, about what happened, but I would also like everybody to take the, ch the time to join with me and keep the families of the victims and the victims themselves in your thoughts and in your prayers. Each one of these victims was a family member and a loved one, and their void and their loss caused great pain, and they did not deserve this. Nobody is deserving of this. We hope this development today will bring some comfort to them as they move forward. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions? You know, uh, sure. Before I do that, I just, you know, I'm, I'm standing back there. I realize I didn't thank my own team. Um, so, uh, so I, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank my chief investigator, Rich Zacharis, uh, who is uh, without, uh, I am so lucky to have. I want to thank uh, Nick Santamartino, ADA Nick Santamartino, uh, ADA Michelle Haddad, ADA uh, Andrew Lee. Uh, I also want to thank my, my chief uh, assistant, uh, uh, Alan Bodie, and I want to thank all of the incredible, incredible analysts uh, that we have working for us at the Suffolk County DA's office. So, uh, ha having said that, I will now answer your question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that there was a tension in 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 the task force, and it was a, it was a, it was a good tension uh, because, you know, there's a tension between getting the the evidence necessary to charge somebody, but also keeping the public safe. Uh, and that's the tension that we always deal with. Uh, so as we were working forward, we were, and, and you know, we had uh, Suffolk County PD, we had the FBI uh, surveilling the defendant. Uh, obviously, that can't be all the time, uh, but we were, you know, we were reasonably assured with that. 
Uh, but this individual was, was, was a person that continued to uh, patronize sex workers at all hours of the night. Uh, he continued to use fictitious um, um, uh, email addresses, fictitious identities, burner phones. Uh, and so as we, we worked through the case uh, and we got closer and closer, uh, all of a sudden, and we built the evidence, suddenly the balance tips uh, in favor of, uh, of public safety. So, uh, you know, I think we, we wanted, we all wanted as a task force to continue it, but uh, I think collectively we felt that it was time uh, to, to, you know, to strike that balance and, 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 and to take him off the street. So that's what we did. I, I don't believe they. Uh, does, that, does anyone? Anybody want to say anything? No, they're they're here. They're they're. I can tell you they're the Waterman, uh, uh, Bartholomew, and Brainerd Barnes uh, family members. But uh, they're here. Uh, they're here first and foremost to support uh, their loved ones, and we're, we're we're happy and grateful to have them here. The, uh, this, this portion had to deal with the deaths of these four young women, uh, and that's what we focused on. That was what the grand jury investigation was focused on. I talked about the commonalities, uh, and the commonalities, uh, all of those commonalities that we talked to were uh, unique to these uh, four separate cases, uh, so that's what we're uh, working on. I think the other uh, members of the task force said, you know, we've got, we're going to continue. Uh, you know, and continue to work and investigate and try to get a small measure of closure for all the victims' families. But for right now, uh, this defendant, uh, it's this defendant with these, 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 uh, these four victims. Is there any relationship between the, the victims and the juror man and the other remaining, other than the four? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, what we did with regard to these four victims. And as I, I open my... my um, my uh, ad address by talking about the need to maintain uh, investigative secrecy. So we are going to maintain that investigative secrecy. And when I talk about other individuals and other cases, it will be after they have uh, they have handcuffs on. The so. I mean, you know, we talked about uh, we talked about you know some of the evidence that was there. Uh, you know, obviously the cast uh, that that's, uh, that phone evidence uh, was 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 great evidence. Um, and then there were other commonalities. There were other inv uh, investi uh, investigations. But I think one of the good things about having a task force is basically you strip it all down uh, and you start from scratch. And then you use the DA's office because the DA's office has to get you uh, li the lifeblood. Of, of an investigation is information. And the way you get information on a cold case is the district attorney's office issues subpoenas in conjunction with the investigators and executes search warrants, again, in conjunction with the, with the, um, uh, the investigators. And, you, and then, you, then you mine all that data, and then, and then you let that data take you where you need to go. So that's what we did in this case. And six weeks in, uh, the, the, uh, the break in the case, uh, a significant break in the case, was uh, was the uh, was the avalanche and the fact that this guy, uh, you know, he was described by witnesses as an ogre. He 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 matched the description of the ogre and where he lived. Was the avalanche the, the link there? Was that that was jumped out? Well, I mean, it was it was a lot of things, right? It was it was it was his uh, physical size. It was his uh, where he lived, where he worked. Uh, the fact that his uh, um, family members were out of the country at the time of the commission of the three murders, uh, the fact that um, he, he now then you start looking into him and then you start getting burner phones. Well, he has, uh, we had up to seven burner phones. He's using these f fictitious email addresses. Um, so then, so then you, you follow him and you get an abandonment sample. Then you go back to some of the old evidence. So it's, you know, there, there, are, there are, I mean, March 14th, uh, 2022 was a huge day for the task force, but uh, you know it, it's it's never one piece of evidence. <coughs> well, there's I mean there's there's like the, what they, they'll call lawman searches, and basically what it is 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 you run a certain make and model of a car and certain other you know where you live or, or what you do for a living, and then you get data and then you mine that data for something that would would, would uh, match with uh, with your 
uh, with your case. And you do that, you don't do that just, you know, you do that 100 times, you know, until, until it hits, until you get the right data points. So we can't, we, we can't talk about, um, we can't talk about uh, ethically in New York, we can't talk about any statements the defendant made, but he, uh, you know, he made, uh, we're not turning over any statements. Uh, so. <laughs> um, I would say he was, yes. Yeah. So the, in between the, in between the bed and the, and the, and the, and the, the cab, there's like a little triangular, uh, um, ornament almost, and it, it's it's unique in the way it's configured. It's unique to to the avalanche. It was unique to the avalanche at that time, uh, and that was something that was pointed out by by witnesses. Might that be obligation? What? Like well, you know, the investigation is is continuing, and and I would never say never. Um, and we're going to continue to look at again. Now, th this is a, a watershed event in the in in this case, uh, and so we've now. Uh, are going out and we're, we're ex executing more search warrants. We'll get more information, more data, and, you know, together uh, we'll look at that and see where it leads. Do you hear that the other victim's family is appealing today? I'm sorry? Did you speak with the other victim's family? Did they tell you how they're feeling today? Which, uh, the, uh, so, so this investigation had to do with um, uh, th these, these four victims, so we've been in touch with the four victims through the grand jury uh, process um, with regard to victims in general and, and other victims, uh, you know, who lost people in the vicinity of that area. You know, we speak uh, to to our victims all the time, but that that's those are conversations that we keep between ourselves. Why did you for one victim that has not been linked to the charges to discuss that with one other? So uh, you know, it, it's um, uh, so first off, Maureen Brainer Barnes. She the the other uh, three one uh, one was was uh, was went. Uh, uh, missing in 2009, uh, I believe the others in 2010. Um, she was in 2007, so it, it was it was a little bit more remote in time. Uh, we are um, we are uh, pro uh, working through evidence. Uh, a lot of that evidence has to do with forensic evidence uh, and analyses that are not completed. Uh, but once those analyses are completed, uh, we are we are. Uh, we feel good about the case, and we're going to just continue to let that process go. And again, I think the the, the, the um, initial plan was to allow the grand jury investigation to go a little uh, further, but uh, at a certain time, uh, again, the, the the task force felt, you know, we need to uh, we we for, for 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 reasons having nothing to do with the evidence in the case, we need to take it down. Um, you know, he's, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, as a prosecutor and as investigators, you know, he is charged with a crime. Uh, there are certain elements in which we, ha we need to prove that crime. We are going to prove those elements. We're going to work hard. We're going to convict him and we're going to hold, uh, him responsible for what he did and whether, you know, what I think of him personally, whether I like him, whether I don't like him, whether I, it doesn't matter. We are going to hold him responsible for what he did in this case. Are there grand jury and panels and the um, The grand jury is um, it's a secret, uh, and we're going to keep it secret. Um, uh, but we have an investigation, and it is continuing. There was a belt that was presented to the press publicly by the Suffolk County Police Department a few years ago with initials on it. I think one of the initials referred to the MW. Obviously, this guy's got an H in his name. Sure does. Can you talk about that? I mean, uh, you know, he has an H in his name. He has, uh, so it's, what was it, HM? Or WH? Or WH. Yeah, so he's got an H in his name, and other, um, other relatives in, in his family have a W in their name. What that means, I don't know. Um, I think that when you look at his uh, internet searches, um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, provides a little uh, in, uh, in, insight into his state of mind. Um, and again, we don't have to prove motive, we have to prove the elements, and that's what we're going to do.
Well, uh, you know, you you, uh, you know, you said woman. Um, you know, with regard to the sex workers, what we did was uh, we we had him under surveillance. Uh, we had other means of monitoring him, uh, and again, it's uh, it's a um, it's a process, and and that process is you have to balance uh, the ability to to to, pr to find e enough evidence to charge him and hold him responsible with the balance of keeping the public safe, uh, and it's it's not easy. Uh, and we decided at a certain point in time that the you know that we needed to take him down because we didn't feel comfortable with it. So that's what we did. Um, I don't think it was so much. Uh, I don't. I don't think it was so much uh, uh, the searches. I think. I think that the conduct of the defendant was was very consistent. I think, but uh, the the quality of our evidence was increasing uh, by the by the by the day by the moment uh, due to the great work of our, our task force uh, uh, partners. So at, at a certain point in time, we're like, okay, uh, you know, we can we can do this. Uh, the uh, uh, the um, uh, I believe the uh, the cause of death is homicidal violence. Obviously, uh, given the length of time and 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 the exposure to a very harsh environment, uh, forensically there there uh, was not uh, you know not a, a lot that that could be done with with, with the remains other than uh, come to that conclusion. He has uh, he has. Uh, he has uh, uh, permits for 92 guns. He has a very large safe in which guns are kept. Uh, we are uh, continuing to um, execute search warrants, so I'm sure we'll have that uh, answer uh, shortly. Can you tell us gaps between when he lost 99 to the rest? Is there any concern that you say another time in that time period for yourself? I'm sorry? I think there's. I think there's. Uh, with, uh, there's always concerns. I think you know we. I. I got into office in January 22. Uh, we worked with our partners. We. We had our first meeting uh, February 1st, uh, and we worked. And and you know March 14th was really that watershed day. And when I tell you, you know, I'd like to brag and say that my office was really working hard, which we were. Uh, but no other agency was working any less hard than we were. Once we realized what we had, and we realized the stakes. All of our partnership, uh, all of our partners really worked. Uh, I mean, I, I think if you look at the, at the folks standing here, uh, I don't think that, you know, uh, in the last 48 hours, any of us have gotten more than three hours sleep. Good morning, um, Maureen Bernard Barnes. Um, how much more do you think your client is going to have? We are going to continue our investigation, and when we are prepared, when we have concluded that investigation. Uh, we will, uh, you know, we will we'll bring that uh, to a conclusion, but we will not do it before. All right, thank you. Do you have one more? Okay, between all the search warrants and the subpoenas, do you ever, do you, like, do you ever think they, they were going to lose them? Like, you know, in between all the searching around and stuff? Uh, I, you know, and I, I don't want to tell you, uh, you know, exact uh, investigative techniques because they're, you know, again, Part of the what reasons why they're um, effective is because people don't necessarily know what that uh, what what it is exactly we do, but uh, always a concern. But given the professionalism of our partners, uh, their diligence and their commitment, uh, we felt good about about the case uh, or keeping the case going until we didn't, and then we took it down. Thank, Th thank you. you. Thank you, guys. The press conference from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. Raymond Tierney kind of speaking. Hustle because we all got and you just heard one of the photographers in the room say that they're now, what they are going to do now is unplug and go outside to do reporter live shots. And um, we're going to stay here with you live, folks. Hey, actually, you know, hold on. Just take a look at this. The enormous amount of people that were in the room, uh, whether you were with one of the various law enforcement agencies that uh, teamed up.
and was part of the Gilgo Beach task force uh, that was represented there uh, in the room. Or perhaps if you were a member of the media, uh, this is news that uh, is more than a decade in the making. Uh, but again, as a reminder, as we're here live across all platforms on WFLA Now, uh, innocent until proven guilty. We're going to replay in a few minutes uh, the Michael Brown uh, press availability from earlier. Michael, we have to, of course, be responsible here and, and talk to you about both sides of what we have. Michael Brown is the attorney who will be, as of now, representing uh, the suspect uh, in this case, suspect Rex Hearman or or Hurman. Both have been used uh, interchangeably over the course of the uh, press conference as far as uh, his last name. 59 years old. And we learned a lot during this press conference. Uh, and I was monitoring your comments uh, on Facebook Live, uh, YouTube Live, uh, over the course of really the beginning section of the press conference. And uh, people were uh, m very surprised that we were getting so much information about the evidence. Well, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll admit, I was sitting here as well. So it is not very common that you have a press conference uh, like this where so much of the evidence is presented up front. Right at the beginning. You had, well, you know, Raymond... Tierney uh, was was speaking, you know, talking about, you know, thanking his, his team members, the various agencies, talking about the victims' families. But then he went into a bit of a deep dive, and I have the list here. We're going to go through the notes, uh, going through the various evidence that was used to make this arrest uh, 13 years after uh, the search efforts that were conducted uh, right here in Gilgo Beach, some of the archive video that we have loaded up here. So uh, there was a good amount of surprise because usually when, when it comes to the evidence that was used to make the arrest uh, in, in so many jurisdictions, so many different states, you'll have a district attorney, you'll have a lead you know, prosecutor uh, say something to the effect of, I, I can't divulge that at this time, or you're going to have to wait for freedom of information laws to allow for that information to be released or the documents to come out, so on and so forth. We've heard it time and time again with various different stories and various press conferences. This was not that type of press conference. Right at the beginning, Raymond Tierney is going through a lot of the evidence that was used from burner phones to the Chevy Avalanche to uh, his search history to mitochondrial DNA advancements. All of these various tools, tactics, and, and evidence that was collected uh, to establish the probable cause necessary for the, uh, for the grand jury here uh, to allow it to get to the stage and then, of course, to proceed uh, with the arrest itself and now the arraignment taking place this afternoon with uh, Hearman being, uh, uh, you know, uh, or excuse me, pleading not guilty. So, um, my goodness, quite a press conference, uh, a long one with different officials speaking. We are going to go through it here live on WFLA Now. Uh, I'm going to start looking for your hashtag HJB hey questions and comments here across all platforms, Facebook Live, YouTube Live. But let's just quickly go through uh, the notes um, all the women were found bound, and uh, interesting note, how they were found bound in Gilgo Beach, in the marshes of Gilgo Beach, in, in camouflage burlap. According to Tierney, this was an attempt to conceal the remains uh, when, they were, when they were left here, dumped here uh, by the suspect uh, in, in this case. Uh, so that is a characteristic that helped investigators more than a decade ago determined that they had a serial killer on their hands on Long Island. Uh, so camouflage burlap, uh, the women were bound in multiple sections of their, at multiple sections of their body using camouflage burlap. Uh, the burner phones that were used, uh, in investigators uh, years ago were able to determine that the suspect in the case was, uh, was using bur uh, burner phones and, uh, and four cell towers were, were pinged uh, by those burner phones, and uh, that helped them to establish an area, um, an area near Massapequa, uh, where uh, they were really focusing their investigation. That burner phone triangulation of those cell towers uh, was part of the evidence that was used here to uh, to to point to Rex Hearman. Uh, mitochondrial DNA advancements that were not available in 2012. Uh, now available, making it um, 
possible for DNA to be used, according to Tierney. And, and here's let's let's go back to what the New York Post reported uh, a few hours ago. This is very important. The New York Post reporting, and they've had they've been talking to various sources in relation to this story, that it was a disposed of pizza crust that gave them a DNA a piece of DNA evidence that was used in this case. Also worth noting that DNA evidence pertaining to family members was also part of uh, part of the equation here, as far as uh, the um, the forensic aspect of this case. Um, the Google search history, you guys, is disturbing. Now, Gilgo, according to Tierney, they found they were able to do a lookup and find that. Hearman was compulsively, that was the word he used, compulsively searching for any information online regarding to the Gilgo Beach murders. And, and in particular, there was a couple of things that he was, that the suspect, according to Tierney, was honing in on based on the search history, uh, cell phones and uh, the victims' um, families. Now, what's, uh, look, a, def a defense attorney, criminal defense attorney, is going to say, my goodness, the entire community was on edge. Everyone was searching about Gilgo Beach. Uh, Tierney is going would argue in this case that uh, that somebody was that the suspect in this case was compulsively looking up uh, information on Google. And look, when it comes to digital evidence like that tying an individual to search history, that a prosecutor is going to have to take a jury down and point to a lot of different factors to prove that it was, in fact, that person doing those Google searches. But then it gets darker. According to Tierney, uh, the person responsible for these Google searches um, are also responsible for looking up torture porn. And that, of course, um, presents uh, a very dark picture as to what the, might have, the motive might have been in this case. And when asked in the Q&A section, uh, according to uh, Tierney, um, you know, he was asked what the motive uh, might have been in this case, and he brought up the uh, the, the Google search history, and I, he was referencing the torture porn as being a very that look. That's a that could paint us uh, a picture as to what it was like in in the mind of a very disturbed individual who is accused of very heinous, really evil acts. The words that were used by uh, Rodney. Harrison, that's the uh, Suffolk County uh, Police Commissioner, he called uh, Hearman a, a demon and a predator. A couple of things of note, uh, it, it sounds as if, based on the press conference, that they have, uh, they have found the Chevy Avalanche, and also, too, that the last burner phone has been collected. Big pieces of evidence. Um, he noted that uh, Hearman was surprised when he was arrested and uh, and that the murder weapon uh, isn't isn't something that they have been able to definitively establish because of uh, the cause of death being homicidal violence and they don't have any definitive murder weapon in this case. That is going to be something I'm sure is going to be evaluated and microanalyzed quite a bit uh, by whomever is putting together a defense for Hewerman, who has, again, pleaded not guilty in relation to the deaths of Melissa Barthelemy, uh, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Uh, also, final two notes I have here. Uh, Hureman is uh, uh, apparently uh, has uh, permits in his name for 92 guns. We do not know if he is known to be an avid gun collector or uh, and, and what... Uh, kinds of firearms he was collecting, whether they were vintage, whether they were, um, you know, what, look, uh, 92 gun permits is going to raise an eyebrow when you're, when you're uh, evaluating a potential suspect for a crime like this. 92 permits doesn't mean 92 guns, but it does in fact mean that there are 92 permits uh, with this suspect's name on it. Uh, what those firearms were used for, why uh, the suspect collected that many permits for firearms. Perhaps that will come out in time. And then look, it, it has to be stated. Tierney says that uh, he was looking at various faces in the room 
responsible for uh, getting to the point of an arrest. And he looked around the room and he says, in the last several days, I don't believe anyone's gotten more than three hours of sleep. That goes to show that the amount of work, the amount of resources, the amount of expertise, the amount of experience, the amount of raw, sheer, just law enforcement will to get into this point cannot, cannot be overstated. So um, uh, just as far as getting to this point, innocent until proven guilty. However, however, law enforcement, uh, as far as getting to this point and finding who they believe and are very, very confident is, you know, as far as them being, res you know, finding the person responsible for this, obviously they have worked really hard and deserve credit. Uh, let's uh, get to the comment section. If you use hashtag HJB, we can animate your comments on screen. Um, Karen Lee wants to know when uh, was that video that's on screen? This is from the search efforts from 2010. This video is more than 13 years old. January, I, I, I don't know the exact month, but this is uh, 10 years old. There's a state police helicopter. Um, and we were talking earlier about Gilgo Beach. And I said it's not exactly, you know, the most scenic beach. It Look, it's very marshy. And while there is a strip of sand there that you could, you know, you know, kind of um, there's an area, of course, where you could pull up your beach chair and I'm sure have a have a very nice, enjoyable experience. Most of the area on the bay side is just marshy and uh, and dense with a lot of brush. You, you can see it here. Look, I mean, this is a very complicated search effort. Uh, somebody who wanted to get rid of something that they never wanted to be found. Look, this is a, this is a difficult search environment, no doubt. Uh, Benjamin Knowles wants to know: Hashtag KJB is the uh, is the only is he the only suspect, or is there more involved? There are more victims. The Gilgo Beach task force was focused on. Four victims, Melissa Bartholomew, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Am uh, Amber Lynn Costello, and Megan Waterman. But there were other victims as well, uh, the remains of which that were discovered right here in the area of Gilgo Beach. Jessica Taylor, Valerie Mack, uh, there's a Jane Doe, there's a John Doe. Um, so this particular arrest pertains to only Melissa Bartholomew. Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Amber Lynn Costello, and Megan Waterman, but they have not obtained enough evidence yet, according to Tierney, to proceed to include Maureen Brainerd Barnes uh, in this arrest. They say that they are still pursuing uh, justice for Maureen Brainerd, Brainerd Barnes, and uh, it will take them um, perhaps additional time to determine whether or not uh, the they believe the suspect in this case uh, Rex Heerman is also responsible for her death uh, as well. Let's continue to look for comments here. Uh, it doesn't matter what platform you're on, hashtag HJB, hashtag on, on Facebook or YouTube. This one's from Facebook. Tony Guerrero uh, says, hashtag HJB, I live on Long Island, and we're glad to have some closure to some of these horrible murders. Uh, closure, um, yeah, Tony, I... I while I know that this might feel like closure today, please be mindful of the fact that with Hearman pleading not guilty, uh, this story isn't exactly going anywhere. So I'd be curious to know, and I understand what you're saying, but for the victims, families, whether or not this feels like closure just yet, I, I'm sure that this feels like uh, this this is encouraging news as the pursuit of justice is ongoing in this case. However, if it feels like closure, I think that, that that's something that really to them, I'm not, I'm not so sure because he has pled not guilty. Uh, it it seems as if a a trial is is inevitable based on on what we have at this stage, and so uh, there's more to come, and. While we do have a very, very interesting list of evidence here that was used in this case to 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 point to this suspect, um, we're we're not at that that section of of the story yet where it's it's a closed book, so to speak. James Earl this is a great question. Hashtag HJB. How long will it take until a trial? 
of course, the um, the the suspect, the the arrested individual, has a right to a speedy trial. Uh, I'm not familiar enough with uh, Suffolk County, uh, the judicial process in Suffolk County, to understand as to when the next um, when. Uh, I might have missed the report as to if there if a future court date has been set. Moderators on YouTube Live, if um, if you if you find anything about a, a next court date, I haven't seen anything yet. Uh, he was um, uh, not given a bail opportunity, so he's being held on no bail uh, in Suffolk County, uh, New York. Dennis says, hashtag KJB, was this a cold case? Yes, this was a cold case. But what is a cold case? A cold case is a case that over an extended period of time, I believe that there is a certain window of time that you can officially label it as a cold case, and that might vary based on jurisdiction when uh, when it's officially declared a cold case. But a, a period of time has elapsed where, um, where the pursuit of justice has stalled a bit. And uh, that's, that's really what a cold case is. And there was a long chapter of this story for many, many years where, um, where things did stall. Um, but it sounds as if uh, there was a renewed interest in sparking life into the investigation in 2012, or excuse me, in 2022, when they, they formed this task force, the task force that was aimed specifically at, you know, look, using advancements in technology, uh, bringing in multiple law enforcement agencies, doing everything they could, bringing all their resources to the table to try to find out who was responsible for these murders a decade ago, more than a decade ago. And so, yes, this was a cold case, uh, but really huge part of this press conference. My, my, my ears perked up when he was beginning to talk about uh, mitochondrial DNA and the advancements that didn't exist in 2012 that are available now that are that that was used to help uh, point investigators in the direction of Rex Hurman. Um, absolutely, um, absolutely fascinating. And also, too, look, we're, we're going to look down down the road a little bit. Bear with me. If you are a criminal defense attorney, you're going to do all the research that you possibly can on the science that was used for this mitochondrial DNA process to get from what the New York Post is reporting, a tossed pizza crust to an arrest and how that factored in. The science behind it has to be, the, the methodology, the actual process has to be scientifically sound enough to hold up in a court of law. And so if it wasn't available in 2012, that means that as far as DNA evidence goes, the process that was used with this mitochondrial DNA is relatively, relatively new and will be tested perhaps in a court of law. Melissa Rihanna on Facebook Live, hashtag AJB, no court date set yet. I'm from this town. However, I am wondering what's been going on for all these years up until now. Well, as somebody who grew up in Nassau County, that's Long Island, that's right here in this, um, in this area, um, I, I, I can tell you that uh, and having family in Suffolk and Nassau counties, look, I can tell you that this has been a, it was a terrifying ordeal. A serial murderer, serial killer, um, wasn't caught in, in, in 2010 when they found all these bodies. And so um, it any time, it doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter if it's New York, California, Florida, Michigan, Ohio, Texas, doesn't matter what state, insert state or region or country here. When you have somebody who is... Uh, and based on this story, targeting petite females, specifically murdering them and dumping their bodies in a, in a marshy rural area, that is going to make people terrified. 
And so there was, there, there, this was, this haunted this community for a long time. Now, eventually time passes to where, um, to, to, to where it, hopefully, hopefully, you know, people are able to not let that fear dictate their, their lives. And they're able to just to, to live with, without living in fear. But it, it's always in the back of your brain. If you're checking out at your local grocery store and, and someone just, you, you, you know, you're, you have an interaction with somebody that just gives you a, a weird vibe, your, your immediate thought is, oh, my God, there's a serial killer on the loose. You're, 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 it's only natural for somebody to um, look at their community and look at people in their community a little bit differently. And so for the folks in Massapequa, look, this is a... Um, look, people have been tweeting that they went to school with Rex Hurman, people who have been tweeting that he was part of their community in this way or that way. Um, a reality is setting in that for uh, the last, you know, 10 plus years, the, the chief, the primary suspect in these, in these slayings has been just a, 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 a relatively prominent person in their community. He's an architect who commuted uh, to to Manhattan for work, and it would come back to Massapequa, where he would live with his family. My goodness, it, it's a um, it's an just an eye opening ordeal for for that community in particular. Meredith hashtag AJB was he looked at before by law enforcement? It's interesting that he was on their radar going back more than a year. That to me is interesting. And, and, you know, we were talking earlier about, my goodness, putting all your evidence out there for tyranny to say, look, we got the, bur we know about the burner phones, we know about the search history, we know about the Chevy Avalanche, we have mitochondrial DNA, to put all those things out there. I mean, you, you could have, I would need a legal expert to really give me their perspective on that tactic, that, that, that choice to publicly at this massive press conference to give all, all that information away publicly. But it also, it, I would imagine, I would imagine that a legal expert would say that they are so confident in their evidence and an evidence building process that lasted more than a year that they, they see this as, you know, lamb door shut case. A legal expert could have that opinion, but I would need a legal expert on on the call to uh, to tell me if that's the line of thinking that it's it, it's just a it, their their confidence level is so high that they have their suspect that they're like yeah this is what we got we have it all we have everything we need or was that would a legal expert say that's a misstep given that. It's basically, from a strategy standpoint, signaling everything you have, or not everything, but some of the key components that the prosecution has to establish probable cause. Not sure. Joseph Connor, hashtag AJB, do you think law enforcement thought he was about to kill again? The DA kept citing public safety. Look, innocent until proven guilty, as I put up this comment, but... Um, no doubt this launches a new phase of the investigation. Serial killers are known to commit crimes and, and can or are very capable of committing crimes over a long period of time. Are there more victims is a fair question to ask at this stage. And so, um, I'm not sure if if they thought that there was an imminent threat, but getting the person off the streets as soon as possible before they have the opportunity or look with serial killers sometimes uh, based on on the profiles, the mental profiles that are established, the personality profiles that are established, uh, serial killers have been known to have these urges, urges to commit heinous acts, evil acts. And so to get, uh, the perpetrator, the, the suspect in this case, off the streets before 
something suddenly would cause or, or prompt that person to commit an act like that again. It was just about getting that person off the streets as quickly as possible. Now, look, 13 years is a long time, but if they have the person responsible, it's better that they have the arrest in 2023 rather than 2033. He's 59 years old. So, um, yeah. I'm cool wants to know, hashtag AJB, they found 10 bodies. What's your take? You think more than one person was responsible? What about Shannon Gilbert? Uh, makes no sense. Yeah, so Shannon Gilbert was the uh, was the woman who uh, originally was the focus of the search efforts. Um, and it wasn't until way later that they found, look, 10 bodies overall um, as they were searching for Shannon Gilbert. And so Shannon Gilbert's remains were eventually found. Um, but look, m my take... My take, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give in, in a, do I, more than one person w was responsible? I'm not an investigator. I can provide context to the information that we have, but I, uh, sort of a blanket, you know, open-ended question like, like this, as far as you think that more than one person was responsible, I'm not an investigator. So I am, uh, hopefully unqualified to answer that question, um, However, it's worth noting that the task force was assembled with the intention of finding the killers responsible for the murders of four women, Melissa, Maureen, Amber, and Megan. And so that leaves other victims whose bodies were found, remains who were found uh, in the area of, of Gilgo Beach that, um, that it's, it's, it's entirely possible that another person is responsible for those deaths. And um, victim attorneys have been coming out and saying, we don't think that it was one person. We think that there was more than one person involved as far as when you look at the just the, the, the volume of bodies, human remains that were found, there is, um, there is, has been put out by, again, the you know representatives of these victims' families um, saying, we don't believe it was one person. We believe it was more than one person. So there's more to this story. That's why when you know we were talking about closure earlier, I understand this might feel like closure today, but at the same time, there's so much more to come with this story. Uh, let's see here. Looking at some other comments. Yeah, so Remy, that's the same thing about more than one perpetrator. That's entirely possible that that more than one person is responsible for murdering and then, you know, dumping bodies at Gilgo Beach. Matabel says uh, it, that it typically takes between two and four years in Suffolk and Nassau counties for, for a case to get to the trial phase. Hopefully they'll do it sooner rather than later. Yeah, this is, again, according to one of our commenters. Uh, I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is if that was the case. It can take a while for uh, such a such a densely populated area like Nassau County, Suffolk County to uh, to uh, for, for a case to materialize. Uh, it, it's not like some more rural counties where um, it, you, there are fewer cases on on the log, so to speak. Um, this is. These are some of the most populated counties in the country. When you're talking about New York City, Nassau County, Suffolk County, these are densely populated areas with a lot of people in those suburbs. So yeah, I would imagine it, it's going to take likely longer than a normal jurisdiction to get to a trial phase. But again, I'm not an expert at a Nassau and Suffolk counties. I'm just providing some some thoughts as to I think it is more likely that it happens slower than faster for what it's worth. 
looking at some other comments. If it has the hashtag, folks, I can bring it up on screen. In fact, I can't even, uh, currently with our format, I can't even see your comments. In this section of the live stream, I can't see your comments unless it has uh, hashtag HJB with it. So if you're trying to get my attention, try to point something out, I can only see it if it's got a hashtag. And again, we use that hashtag system so that your username, your, your profile picture, you're basically saying you want us to feature you on our live stream. Hopefully that makes sense. My goodness. Uh, let's let's go through it again. M. Kim says, what linked police to the suspect initially? Um, the, the, a vehicle, a Chevy Avalanche, a, a, a profile that was established, a physical profile of, of a man, 6'4", large build, glasses. That also helped. Uh, mitochondrial DNA samples, uh, a Google search history that was disturbing. Uh, burner cell phones and cell phone tower pings in the area of Massapequa, New York. Um, we went over it a little bit earlier, but really the New York Post reported based on the um, based on the bail documentation that was released that it was a pizza crust, a thrown out pizza crust that was discarded, according to the documents by Rex Yurman, the suspect that was collected by investigators that was used to get a DNA profile linked to um, linked to this case. I mean, just, I mean, that is the type of stuff. Look, that's the type of stuff that you see on, on TV shows and movies, the investigators sitting in, you know, in, in, a, in an unmarked SUV with binoculars waiting for the, waiting for the potential suspect to walk out of the pizza shop. And they're saying, Oh man, really hope he doesn't eat the crust. Really hope he doesn't eat the crust. And then takes the crust and throws it, and they're in the they're in the car going, yeah, he didn't throw out the crust. And then they can go and look. Once it's discarded, they can collect it. Or it might not have been that if it was a pizza crust. Look, they could have collected it from his trash. If it was discarded on the street and it was left out. But then if it but then if you do not physically have evidence of him being the one biting into the the, the crust, then of course. You're, you're talking about other potential people in the household leaving that DNA evidence. But for the record, the crust is great. On a good slice of pizza, you eat the crust, right? Right, you guys? Yeah, Mark says in the comment section, the, the crust is like the best part. So look, I would eat in the crust. But that's just me. Uh, fun fact, I, I grew up in a pizzeria. Yes, my, our, my family owns a pizzeria on Long Island. Very close to here. So I am very familiar with this story. So my family owns a Italian restaurant and pizzeria. Uh, on Long Island, a little fun fact about me that people don't really know. I one of my I had, I had a lot of jobs growing up. One of my very first jobs was delivering pizza. Pizza delivery guy. I mean, young. I mean, uh, I was like just old enough to drive, and then my one of my first jobs was delivering pizza. Uh, so um, I see pizza crust. I, I'm, th I'm thinking immediately like uh, like. Uh, an investigator perhaps having surveillance on um, th th there's so many different ways that they could have obtained that pizza crust uh, but that is certainly a component to this story because it helped establish a DNA profile linked to the case and then of course I have a connection to this story because I, I went to high school on Long Island uh, I, I, I have been to Massapequa many times I used to drive all the time on Ocean Parkway that's the road that you're seeing here in this video I've never really stopped in Gilgo Beach. Gilgo Beach isn't really a, an, a, there isn't a lot there. It's not really a place where you would, you would go. It's not a destination, if you will. Um, it's marshy and, and remote, and it's got all this brush in it. it. To the west is Jones Beach. I used to go to Jones Beach all the time uh, growing up. That's, that's really the area. If you're on Ocean Parkway, it's usually a lot of traffic for Jones Beach. But... Um, but yeah, look, this is not um, this is not an, an area you see a lot of tourists or uh, or beachgoers, if you will. So. Uh, 
Uh, there's a lot of folks in our comment section um, asking uh, for uh, a summary of the case. We, we've been kind of doing that over the last... I want to... I be respectful to the wishes of our live audience because I, I have repeated myself many times with the evidence and what we know about the case. So, Yeah, a lot of people talking about pizza crust now. Uh, and look, yeah, look, um, I'm a guy who eats the crust. Um, but you don't always eat the crust. You have a lot of pizza... And maybe you're on your last slice and all of a sudden you're full and maybe I would skip the crust, but I like eating the crust. That's just me. I, I'm just looking at her comments now and I'm just seeing pizza crust all over the place. Um, I don't shy away from comments like this. Uh, Jenna says, hashtag hey, JB, talk about why it took over a decade to figure this out. Unacceptable. These murder investigations are so complex. And when you're talking about them drawing a box over an area of Long Island and they're drawing a big area around these four cell towers saying, we know whoever is responsible for this had cell phone tower pings from this area over an extended period of time. It's not like drawing a box over, like, just any county. Have you ever seen Long Island from the air? Have you ever been? Have you been to Long Island? It, the, the, it, it's, it's really, it's suburbia. It, it's just suburbs. So you draw a box around a section like Massapequa. We're not talking about you know, a few hundred residents living in that box. We're talking about thousands of households, potentially. So that's thousands of potential suspects. And somebody who, if you believe tyranny with the camouflage burlap, somebody who was taking, who was very meticulously trying to cover their tracks. You have somebody who's responsible for these murders but somebody at the same time who is uh, going up, it, it's not, it, this, these, based on, on what this appears to be deliberate, obviously, acts to murder these, 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 these female victims. And so um, somebody who's doing this with intent, somebody who has the potential to be calculating, and somebody who is trying to deceive law enforcement potentially, there's, um, this is why there's so many cold cases. And look, justice will eventually chase you down, but justice um, takes different avenues, different streets, different roadways. Sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long. In this case, they finally have what they describe as the primary suspect for Melissa, Megan, Amber, and maybe also as well Maureen. But it took, it took time. It also took technology. The mitochondrial DNA technology that was used that wasn't available in 2012. So uh, to call this unacceptable, um, I would ask this, uh, Jen, I would, uh, would, you, would you say that to an investigator if, if, if he was sitting across from you at the restaurant? He was talking with you in person. Would you say, oh, my goodness, this took 10 to 13 years. Unacceptable. Would you say that to a person who has been working tirelessly behind the scenes to find the person responsible for what has been described as a very complex set of murders? I, I understand that it, it, it is easy to, on a keyboard, punch in the word unacceptable, but um, as somebody who has worked with uh, covered news in many different states and worked with a lot of different law enforcement agencies over the years and, and um, gotten a little bit more both in an on-camera capacity and an off-camera capacity, got to know law enforcement officers and investigators and, and had conversations with them. You watch CSI, you watch Law and Order, you think that 
it's just so easy for to wait for the commercial break to roll and then boom they have a suspect it, 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 please do not get confused with um what you know shows and movies portray as um as what an investigation looks like when in reality they are extremely extremely complex hopefully that makes sense Uh, I had this earlier, uh, Stephanie, there, um, the family, I don't think we, we have heard from the family just yet. I wonder if, very curious to see if they, if they release a statement, new Britain wants to know how far did the suspect live from where the bodies were found? Uh, I had it earlier, but you know what? Just for the purposes of, of live streaming, let's go to Google maps and we're going to do, all right, Massapequa, New York. Directions to Gilgo Beach. And while it's not a perfect line across, look, it's a 20 minute drive from Massapequa. Is that, is that the Wonton? No, it's not the Wonton. It is. <laughs> I, I, I grew up here. So I, I'm looking at these maps and I, I, I the Wonton State Parkway, which you would use. Uh, to get down to either Jones Beach or Gilgo Beach, um, I've driven on. I've driven on the Wanta State Parkway more than I could possibly count in my life. Meadowbrook, the Wanta, the Seafood Oyster Bay Expressway, the Southern State. These are all the roads I grew up driving. So yes, twenty minutes, fifteen miles away, less than fifteen miles away. Less than 15 miles separates Gilgo Beach and Massapequa, and what's really between it is South Oyster Bay. In fact, in, in the coming weeks, I will be very close to here. I'm making a trip back to New York to see family. I, I will be right near Massapequa. In fact, I might pass through Massapequa. Actually, I think I am passing through Massapequa. I used to, again, mentioned earlier that I used to deliver pizza because it was like one of my first jobs growing up before I even, you know, went to college. Um, I used to deliver pizza. I'm looking at a map now. It's, it's really becoming apparent to me. So close to here. I used to drive in this area quite a bit. Not as much right in Massapequa, but the entire area here of, of the south end of Long Island. Mm -hmm. I know exactly where this all is. I know the turn on the Wanta. I know, I know the exit. It's W5 that you would turn to get to Gilgo Beach. Yeah, so it, it, it's very apparent to me. I'm looking here at all this. Couple more questions, comments before we before we wrap up our live stream here today. <laughs> One of the few people who knows, I'm not gonna divulge it here on stream, but my family's pizzeria. Uh Kim is one of the few people who actually knows apparently my my family's pizzeria. Yes, my my family owns an Italian restaurant and pizzeria. And so uh, it's not far from this place. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, you know, Sherry, I, I don't remember how many of the remains were found by the by the cadaver dogs by the by the canines but i know at least one at least one cuz in, in reviewing my notes from not my notes but in reviewing reporter notes from this story years ago they talked about how the canines in particular were so important to tracking down the remains that were found here at gilgo beach i mean um 
uh, they were heroic efforts by the canines. Uh, they were able to 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 track sense and and get through through some of the brush and um, you see it here on, on video. It, it's in this archive video for a reason. Those canines were integral to the actual search efforts themselves. So I'm really glad that one of our commenters noted that. Stormy, I am not going to put that comment on screen, but yeah, that's, um, I have some phone calls to make. Sally, I, I, uh, without putting the comment on screen, I, we're getting here to the, uh, to the end of this live stream. I will just share that it took a lot of, um, it, it took a lot of practice over the years to, to not, uh, to have a more neutral accent. I don't know if I've completely lost my New York accent. However, um, yeah, people have been, I've seen a lot of comments about if, if I grew up in New York, why don't I have an accent? Well, there's a whole story about that. But um, it, 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 you don't, it, it takes time to develop, as far as newscasting goes, right? Um, to develop a more neutral accent so that you're, because I've covered news in states from New York to Alabama. And so having a, trying to, attempting to have a more neutral accent is, Something that they teach. Uh, so many, any other on-topic questions before we wrap up the live stream here? Got to have the hashtag system, the hashtag uh, HJB, otherwise I can't see it. Ed, ooh, hold on, I lost it. Ed says, wait, hold on. Oh, there was somebody who said watching from Scotland. Ed says, hashtag HJB, I know the area well, perfect dumping ground. Look at it. The video tells you the story. It's, it's, uh, it's this, the bay side of Ocean Parkway is not really a place where you're going to, you know, unfold that beach chair and relax. It, it's just, it's, look at it. It, it, it. It's marshy and thick with brush and, uh, uh, Giselle, that's makes me smile. That comment. Uh, I, I'm wondering this too. Saskia Stander, hashtag KGB, what's the next step in the legal process? Well, um, first, it's going to be it's going to be very interesting to see if any other additional uh, charges are established. Um. These are just the initial set of charges. They say that they're continuing their investigation. Um, and then um, any pretrial hearings are going to take place. And, um, you know, the, the case will take shape. And, and it depends on, on the judicial system in Suffolk County as to when exactly they're going to proceed towards, um, towards trial. That Hopefully we get some answers with that next week. It's not going to happen over the weekend, but hopefully by next week. We at least get an idea as to when the next hearings are going to be. Um, yeah, that's going to do it for our live stream here, folks. Really appreciate all the, some very kind comments, but really the story it, we were talking about. The only reason I was talking about myself a, a bit more on this live stream was just because I know this area. I know, I, I again, I'm not stopping for a cup of coffee. I didn't say coffee, but coffee in um, in Gilgo Beach because it's not really that. That's not really the the type of place it is. Uh, however, um, I do know this area really well. And so, um, I know the exact turn where you would go to get to Gilgo beach from Massapequa. So look, um, a lot more to come on this story. 
I will try to live stream developments or tweet out developments as they happen. You can follow me on social media. Uh, this is the part of the live stream where we talk about uh, where you can find me. I'm at WFLAJB across all platforms. Uh, Facebook, which we're live on right now. Hello, Facebook. Uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, TikTok, and yes, now Threads. Real quick, are people on Threads? Are we doing the Threads thing? Can I get some comments going on YouTube Live, Facebook Live. Are we do? Is, is Threads a thing? Because I, I don't even know. All social media platforms have their, you know, their identity, right? Facebook has an identity. Believe me, Facebook has an identity. Twitter has its own identity. TikTok, Instagram, they all have their different purpose and their different means of connecting people to one another or connecting people to content. But what is Threads all about? I don't know yet. It's too early. It just launched, so... I don't know. Look, I'm on threads for what it is worth. F-W-I-W. All right. I, I'm not exactly sure um, what uh, it, it's going to be intended for, that, that platform, if it's just going to be another Twitter. But we'll see how it all takes shape. There's no live streaming on it, so that's a problem to me. But uh, look, I really appreciate everybody joining us here. Hopefully this was um, uh, coverage that you know, you were able to um, get answers and get um, dependable information. We had the press conference uh, at four o'clock. It was roughly an hour or so, roughly, right? A little, maybe a little bit less. Oh well, no, it started late. So it's, yeah, it was about, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, the entirety of the press conference. And then of course we've had our post press conference uh, discussion here live interactively on WFLA now. Really appreciate um, all the comments. Our moderators know where I'm going next. Feedback, really important to the process. You telling us what you would like to see more of, less of, how we can stream better for you from the Stream Center. Um, what stories you want to see more of. Um, what, um, how we can improve the process of you interacting with us as well. So um, it's very important. Feedback is so important. So. If you would like to provide feedback on how we're doing here at WFLA Now, how we're doing here on live stream, whether it's good, bad, suggestions, try this, do that, whatever you want to say, just raw feedback to the newsroom, which is that way, and, 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 the, and really the people that, uh, that work on helping us do these live streams, uh, you can send it to news at WFLA.com. Again, that's news at WFLA.com, just an email. If you're looking at providing feedback or suggestions directly to me, not not the the powers that be, so to speak, but you want to email me directly, it's heyjb at wfla.com. Um, so those are the two ways: either feedback generally uh, to to our to our news operation uh, at news at wfla.com, sending an email there, or to me directly at heyjb at wfla.com. Uh, there's a lot more on this story. Amber Costello. Uh, is a victim uh, that you heard a lot about uh, over the course of the press conference. Uh, we, as we were doing the story, we, of course, it became very uh, apparent to us that she used to live right here in the Tampa Bay area. She is formerly of Clearwater. So we have a comprehensive report on WFLA.com about Amber Costello specifically. Uh, you can find it by clicking on the link in the description on this video. You can also find it in the pinned comment if you're joining us live. Thanks so much for joining us here on WFLA Now. You can follow me at WFLAJB across all platforms. Happy Friday and have a great weekend wherever you're watching from. Signing off from the Stream Center in Tampa, Florida.